you can see those who are on Facebook, and you cannot see those who are on Telegram, but we can see them. And I usually apologize to them that we cannot take their questions from them because of logistics. We are very grateful to our staff, Shegun Olokwade, who worked with us for three years, has established his own company and he has moved on. And a new person, Ajadi, has been hired. Ajadi has a diploma uh, in technology from a Nigerian Polytechnic. Welcome, Ajadi. And our various staff, the various university students from various countries who join us as volunteers. And our consultant who has been with us for many years now, Professor Aliso, Brandeis University, and Palumi of University of Louisiana State. We cannot thank you enough. As we agreed, we will go around in an order and I will introduce each person when is their turn. The advantage of this is that each segment can be cut into its own podcast and used for teaching purposes. And at the end, when everyone has spoken, we'll bring them together to reflect on what should be the outcome of this conversation. To members of the audience who are in a hurry to ask questions, you have to wait till the audience segment when you can ask your question. It's my pleasure to introduce our elder, the distinguished, distinguished Professor Negash, I'm too small to introduce him, but I will do so with apology. A professor of English and African literature who has also served as the director of the African Studies Program at Ohio University. He founded and chaired the Department of Eritrean Languages and Literature at the University of Asmara between 2001 and 2005. His research include modern African literature from the Horn of Africa. His own research in South Africa is an expert on critical theory. He does translation and is famous for his scholarship on oratory and literature in indigenous African languages. He's done eight major books on literature, literature in Eritrea covering the 19th century. He's himself written a novel, The Conscript, which has been translated into English. It's published in a wide range of spaces, MLA, Research in African Literatures, in Bizo, Bank Biography, he's a member of the African Academy of Sciences, and he has also received fellowships on the National Endowment for the Humanities, Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Studies, and he conveyed the annual conference of the African Literature Association twice. And in 2021, he served as a distinguished president of the African Literature Association. Welcome, uh, Professor Nagash. Welcome. Hello. Hello, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very extremely generous introduction. Uh, I am uh, very delighted, uh, pleased uh, to be part of this conversation. I have been following, I have attended some of them, of course. Uh, these are extremely intensely useful conversations, which um, I have a different moment called um, decolonial dialogues, not only because they are helpful for the education of our students and ourselves, but also they kind of 
connect us over 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 shared concerns and interests regarding uh, uh, African studies. Thank you. In the uh, next twenty in the next twenty minutes, I I will be asking you questions in three areas, and these three areas are derived from your long studies and interest, and also my own interest. When people call me an historian, sometimes I rebel. I said, I'm, I am an epistemologist. Because basically, for the most part, I do more epistemologies than history. And all my recent books, they tend to be in the area of epistemology. So I'm interested in that. And how, in your own thinking, how do these, epistemolog these epistemologies we use to understand Africa, how are they formed? And how could we shift these epistemologies? Uh, that, that would be my first question. Uh, and you can spend um, seven minutes around issues of the formation of epistemologies, if you don't mind. Because to me, that sh should be the area we have to begin this conversation. Uh, that is a, a very interesting, uh, wonderful question. I will go to that. Uh, uh, just a slight correction and the mistake was on me on my part. Uh, in your introduction, you mentioned that I wrote uh, the conscript. I am a translator of the conscript into English language from Tigrinya, but it was my fault. I, I think it was not clear enough. Uh, having said that, I mean, the question of uh, epistemology, uh, it has a very long history. Uh, but in its kind of current um, uh, form, uh, as we got it, is it's mainly from the from 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 the post structuralist uh, episteme. Is of course, as you know, as many of us understand it, it comes. It's a Greek word. Its, it's origin is 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 from Greek uh, uh, language. Uh, but the way epistemologists understand it, or the the notion of the episteme. Uh, it is a set of, of relations that unites different discursive practices. This is a quotation from Michel Foucault. I'm using this because he was the one actually uh, elaborated on this, on this point. Uh, what he meant by that, this set of relations that unites, connects discursive practices, it means the statements, the concepts, the constellation of ideas. This discursive practices, I will elaborate a little bit further, uh, they generate uh, scientific knowledge, scientific knowledge across disciplines, starting from the humanities, uh, the medical professions, anthropology, history, and, and, and what have you. Uh, so slowly, slowly, uh, because of these discursive practices, they have to be repeated also again and again. Uh, narratives are created, statements are created, a worldview is created, uh, and this becomes become they become the, the sciences. When we have the, the 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 scientific disciplines and the scholarships, we usually have also people who kind of carry them, so to speak. There are exponents of the theories of the statements. For example, uh, the idea of structuralism, the idea of Marxism, or the idea of in your own. Uh, I, I I I think. Um, uh, 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 discipline in history, there must be also people who are kind of coming with new ideas. The idea, for example, creating new paradigms in linguistics like Chomsky and so on. These are the people who create actually the, the, the discursive practices or discursive formations. Once this is set, it, it, becomes, it becomes kind of, uh, there is also underlying subtext of power relationship uh, at a global level then it becomes kind of the dominant, the mainstream idea to which not just uh, academics and scientists and scholars, but also the general population kind of listens to who is speaking, how, how should we do this, and so on and so forth. So um, in themselves, discursive practices, discursive formations, uh, epistemologies, they are not bad. Actually, they are good. Science is good, as we know. But there is also a context, always a context is created. And the context can vary uh, from place to place, but if the context is created, in a, if, if we are thinking in terms of correlations, for example, uh, let's go back, let me take you back to the major figure, epistemological figure, 
uh, exponent of a particular set of ideas, a paradigm. I'm thinking of Hegel, uh, who kind of had the platform to speak about Africa. Africa has no culture. Africa has no civilization. Africa is, has no language. Africa has no history. Uh, Africa has, 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 has no civilization and so on and so forth. So, and then once that idea that epistemology is, pro is created, it is set, it is established, then it is reproduced and it comes in different forms. It goes to the branch to the different disciplines. It goes to linguistics. It, well, African languages are, maybe we'll, for sure we'll talk more about it later, but it goes to history. It, it, it influences other methodologies across, across disciplines. Uh, I think the question is when when you kind of bring up this how epistemologies how uh, knowledge is produced. Uh, the question comes when the, when when knowledge is produced, there is something also very important for us to ask, and that is where were the Africans when these paradigms, these uh, discursive practices were created? Uh, of course, Africans were producing, and just in your presentation in the slides. Uh, before before we we we, we start we started the, the transmission, uh, you mentioned Timbuktu. We could I could mention Aksum and other places as well. So Africans were producing knowledge. Africans had religion. Uh, some of them have had even script like this in you know the classical language of Eritrea and Ethiopia and other parts of the world. But then there was this what we call epistemic violence uh, at work. Uh, the European kind of epistemology was uh, kind of the, this is self-perceived uh, uh, superiority towards the other indigenous uh, Afri uh, uh, African uh, knowledge systems. So it was dominated because of colonialism, because of imperialism. And this is where the overlap or the connection between power, uh, in this case, particularly between colonization uh, and imperialism and epistemology comes to work. Uh, I will just, uh, before be before stopping, I think he gave me seven minutes, I I'm looking at my watch a little bit, uh, but if I, <laughs> I may add, uh, let's also be reminded uh, that the knowledge production, in terms of, we consider in terms of the global order, uh, have been created in 68 languages. These are the Indo-European languages, so the European languages and if you go a little bit, if you want to add further, there is the Latin and, 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 and uh, Greek language as well. The other languages, the participation of African languages particularly, although it was, it was present, although it had presence, uh, it, is, it is kind of left on the margins. It's always superseded as if it was not there uh, because of the, of, the, of, the power, of the power dynamics. Uh, let me stop there by way of introduction and I will listen to your question. Thank you. Uh, I'm very grateful. Um, should we focus more on literature than on language? Oh, how will you resolve that? Uh, I think they have, they have, <laughs> they have, they have functions of a, a role to play. Uh, I just mentioned, I think, in, uh, in responding uh, previously. Uh, to your question regarding Hegel, uh, literature has benefited Africa, particularly if we are thinking uh, about uh, about about uh, texts like Things Fall Apart. Uh, it is effectively, you can read it that way, you can interpret it that way. It has been interpreted and read that way. It is probably a belated response to Hegel, right? I was saying Hegel considered Africa, described Africa as cultureless, storyless, civilizationless, as a barren place. If you look at, 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 at things far apart, Achebe is responding to these questions. We have religion, there is discussion about religion, there is discussion about governance, there is discussion about very sophisticated kind of negotiating the nuances of gender, even if you like, right? Uh, all these things, so uh, literature has played a, a major role I would like also to invoke uh, our great Ngugi from, 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 from Kenya. Uh, he was the one also who gave us kind of this uh, counter uh, discourse uh, when I just mentioned there are epistemological figures. He is, he is one of the epistemological figures, but he created a, a counter discourse. And he gave us this notion of 
decolonizing the mind. He was among the first in Bungi, actually. He was among the first, if I may take a little bit of time here, uh, uh, the first who kind of started pushing back, speaking back. Um, even probably, uh, even probably, chronology is always kind of risky. But even probably, people like you know the great Palestinian thinker Edward Said, who wrote this you know major kind of uh, books and interventions, uh, writing back uh, and and speaker and so on. But with Ngugi, uh, uh, literate uh, writing and theoretical as well as literary writings, I think he made a huge contribution. So I think the, the role of, of literature in the production of knowledge uh, is, is enormous, is enormous. A little bit the unfortunate, probably uh, the unfortunate uh, situation with our languages is, uh, with the exception uh, of Ethiopia and Eritrea, who have, have that's, those countries have very long tradition of writing in their own languages, uh, probably uh, also in in some parts of Nigeria, I, I know there are there, there, there is literature you know in, in, in Yoruba and other languages and, and Swahili of course not to forget that uh, it is not um, the languages are not being used in the literature. So the uh, attempt the push uh, should be um, using this 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 these languages uh, for literary purposes as well. So I would say it is end end. Uh, there, there are, there are, there, there is literature. There is literature in European languages, in the European languages. We are not going to dismiss that. It has played enormous role. It continues to really play a great role. I'm thinking of people like Adichie and so on and so forth, uh, who are contributing to the conversation, to the decolonial conversation in the diaspora as well as in the continent. But we need the local indigenous African languages also to be used for literary purposes. Thank you. Why do you think uh, Ngugi and Achebe missed the Nobel? Uh, come again? Why do you think Achebe and Ngugi missed the Nobel Prize? Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, I wouldn't know. Uh, there are there are kind of some um, probably uh, very specific reasons, but uh, I would say that the Nobel Prize is, is also an institution uh, it is part of what I was calling, referring to, uh, there must be some discursive practices, some discursive formations that the Nobel Prize institution have great, great respect for, for, for the institution, but it is also part of the, of the formation who deserves the Nobel Prize, who, who, who does not deserve the Nobel Prize. Uh, it, is, it is a committee that also, just like uh, everyone else works with with constraints. Uh, some say, but some say I'm saying uh, some say because they were too critical, probably, or or there might be other considerations. I I don't have I, I don't have a very specific answer, a good answer for you. Uh, I'm just guessing now. So, if we write canons, and you've done so in your conversation, and by canons I mean the name you are invoking, Achebe Anungugi. If we, if we invoke canons, how does that not affect the younger generation? I, I go to Kenya and there was a time in Nairobi we were talking and people were saying, well, after Angugi, there is only one or two writers. And I said, you can talk like that. You can talk like that. Does this canon, as good as they had, do they have damaging impact on later writers? Uh, there is, of course, a sense of always nostalgia going back to the to the past, right? We love the past. Uh, we are overwhelmed by the past. Somebody called it, I forget the name, but there was a, a very famous professor, I think it was in, 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 in Yale, who wrote this book called The Burden of the Past. The Burden of the Past is if your ancestors, the people who were in the field, uh, it can be in any field, were, were kind of great, then you have the burden of emulating them. You can't just do what they did or, or, or just kind of being, you know, equal to them. You have, you have to excel them. But it's very difficult to go, to, to go beyond your ancestors. They are always bigger than you are. Uh, 
Uh, so this is the burden of the past. I think uh, the younger generation has. Uh, in terms of decolonization, I think in terms of launching the decolonial projects, writing this, this writers, Gugi, Achebe, Sheyinka, you know, that generation, they did uh, a, merge, a, merge, uh, a wonderful job. Uh, it is also thanks to them that actually we are having this conversation today. Otherwise, we not have this conversation today. It would be just an empty one. They were our 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 kind of. Uh, they started the counter discourse, the conversation, if you like, the decolonial dialogue with the West. Uh, if you read, if you read Acheb uh, Yoruba uh, uh, Shayinka, uh, he is doing that. If you read uh, uh, Ngugi explicitly, if if you if you read Achebe, he's telling the stories. He's a story a storyteller. He's doing that too. Uh, the younger ones, uh, it is not their fault. I would say uh, most of them are writing uh, in the diaspora. They are situated in, in the diaspora. The ones, at least, I read, and they have been reproached, uh, criticized for kind of you know quote unquote selling out. I don't see them that way. Uh, they are contributing to, they are continuing actually the, 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 liter the, the literary work. Uh, at the same time, the alienation is kind of unfortunate. Uh, alongside the, the, the Eurocentric or Europhonic, I, I meant to say, Europhonic African languages, uh, there is a necessity actually. There is a desire, expectation also for literature that is produced in, in the local language. But it, it is also, it has to do with the market. Uh, we are saying these things from the diaspora, uh, people in the continent that includes the universities, the institutions, if we, even the African Union kind of need to work on this one. Mm. So uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm not thinking in terms of hierarchy. I'm, 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 I'm kind of thinking in terms of continuation. Um, the next generation will also do something else, something different. So how will, you feel, how will you feel if I were to tell you that we now have a generation of students who even do literature in African universities. They know what their teachers have presented to them on Nunguki and Shoyinka, but they have not read those books themselves. Uh, in the higher education, including in the United States now, the say the traditional kind of literary uh, studies are in the decline. People want to, to, to do other things because of the, we live in a different era, the digital era. So people are more into composition, into creativity, into rhetoric and so on and so forth. At the same time, uh, the, 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 the hardcore, the traditional, so to speak, the conventional literary canon is in place. For Africa, the problem seems to me, and I have worked in some African universities, uh, or traveled, have experience with that, including West Africa, Southern Africa, of course, Eritrea. Um, the, it seems to me that uh, you mentioned this canonization. The curriculum is old. It's, it's, it's really outdated. Uh, so whereas my students here are doing something else, probably uh, students in, in, in African universities are reading kind of old, old texts and so on and so forth. But not also, that is that complicates the problem uh, we have, but also not reading the African texts by Chebe and, 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 and Dungugi. This has to do, of course, with institution building. I don't know how many African uh, universities have departments of African uh, languages and literatures. Probably Nigeria has some strong ones, probably Kenya, probably I'm just guessing here. Um, Others will, will kind of hope, uh, correct me, uh, probably South Africa, but I don't see, I don't hear uh, whenever I travel um, something news about robust programs in African literatures and, 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 and languages. So uh, I think the, 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 the burden is on us, the burden is on the Africans. We cannot keep blaming the West as we kind of <laughs> tend to do. Uh, so. The, the solution should come from the diaspora, from the global community, but also from the African institutions. Thank you. Uh, I'll bring you back when the others join us because I have more questions. We are very grateful. Very Please uh, stay, don't leave. Let me now invite Professor Falungam 
uh, of um, Boston University. Uh, he's a professor of anthropology. He once directed the African Studies Center and his research interest include the interactions between African languages and non-African languages, the ad adaptation of Islam in Africa, Ajami literature, and he uses African Ajami to understand history, socio-cultural issues, and the religious heritage of many West African people. Is extremely famous, holding Fulbright, ACLS, and Guggenheim Fellowship, and has received support from a variety of grant agencies. He's published in major journals, and his book, Muslims Beyond the Arab World, The Odyssey of Ajami, I have the privilege of reading that text while in draft form won the 2017 Ask of its Prize for the best book on Africa. Welcome, welcome, Professor Falu Ngam. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm well, honored to be here. What will you say if I were to tell you that things fall apart has not been translated into Fulani or Ausa or Ajami? Well, thank you very much for uh, the invitation, and uh, I'm most grateful to be here and see my uh, older sister and older brothers here. Uh, most grateful. <clears throat> I think that to answer your question, I would probably little his historicize the problem a little bit, yeah. and I think that's important because of the colonial legacy that has rendered or defined literacy as only literacy in European languages or the ability to use the Roman script. And that legacy has permeated all African traditions, all African institutions, so that when someone is studying liter literature in West, in Francophone Africa, it really, what it really means is they're studying French literature. <laughs> If they're in an English uh, part of Africa, literature, the assumption is that good literature is really European literature. Okay. So therefore, our own intellectual productions have been dismissed from the very core of knowledge production. So it's not a surprise that major African writers are not even known in their own communities. And you're talking about these famous ones. But in my work in Ajami, there are very famous local Shakespeare's. I call them local Shakespeare's, local uh, 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 Chaucer's, and who were writing, some of them were writing even before. But the, the, the sad part is that there's a rift in our communities so that within the same family, you will see that the people who are trained in one mode, in the local mode, compared to the people who are trained in the Eurocentric mode, they rift as they evolve. So, 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 so that, for example, those who are trained in the Ajami traditions become poets and very famous in their own world, but they're in the informal sector. And those who are promoted are those who are in uh, writing in French and English and uh, uh, using the Roman script. So that's why my big challenge, and I think that's for me the most important element, is to recognize that history did not begin in the 19th century. To look at history from a long durée. And archives now allow us to be able to do that. To see that in fact intellectual productions in African languages, despite the suppression of African languages, these systems have not died. In fact, they have flourished in many parts. And now the challenge is how do we preserve them? And how do we train a new generation who have the skills needed to access the information buried in them? Because they have never been, we have never been trained to do so. Yeah. So I think that's the first challenge. The first challenge is how do we train the new generation of scholars 
who can read Yoruba in Ajumi, who can use, who can read a Giz text, who can read Wall of Ajumi. In the same way, they can read a uh, classical uh, Shakespearean poetry or Shakespearean in Old English. You know? And I think that's really the challenge we face. And the result is, is simply because we haven't taken these seriously until now. So I think now we do have an opportunity to expand the canon of literature, actually. Because even despite the great contributions of our great leaders uh, who have been mentioned here, Ngugi Wachongo and, and others, we're still operating within the understanding that literature is literature in Roman scripts. <laughs> but how about, how about Musa Ka by Jahate who is writing in Ajami script? How about the Hausa who are writing in Ajami scripts? How about the, Tif you know, the Berber who are writing in Tifinak and all the scripts? How about the literature that is produced in the Bamung kingdom in Cameroon in uh, Bamung script? I think all of these need to be incorporated in the definition of, 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 of what lit African literature is. And I think that it's important because uh, all of what I have found that's so fascinating when I look at the literature that is produced by uh, these people who are outside of the canon of Euro Europhone ways of writing or Europhone literature is that when they write, whether they are Muslim or Christian or non-Muslim or non-Christian followers of traditional religions, they're writing as Africans. They're not writing as Muslim, or as Christian. No, they're writing as African. And in their sources, you actually see that it's, it's, it's really an African who is speaking, conveying preoccupation and reflecting local epistemologies. And I think, I think this is so fundamental to incorporate that in our training of the new generation. And as my big brother just mentioned, uh, Girmay, the challenge is we, I think we need to reform our institutions. Because uh, there is no department, for example, in Francophone Africa, where, of course, as we know, the direct assimilation rule consequence still lingers. I remember when I was teaching, uh, when I had the uh, luck to, to be a Fulbright, uh, a Fulbright scholar at the University of St. Louis, my classes, my linguistic classes, incorporated naturally students from different ethnic groups. So I use the I use data from those different ethnic groups <laughs> to study linguistics. And I and I and I was so impressed by the student, even when they were on strike, they came to my class <laughs> because it resonated with them. And it began to diffuse ethnic tensions. For example, I remember one student one time, or Wolof, who thought that Wolof was probably the most important language, the most beautiful language, and we did an exercise on the Mankai animist from the southern part, who have a completely different conception of illness. So, so then we were discussing how in Wolof you have two words with, uh, you, you know, they separate to be ill and to be wounded. For the mankind, they don't separate the two. To be wounded is the same as to be ill. Because to be wounded is one type of sickness. <laughs> And it was interesting for the student to realize that, in fact, well, this is so interesting. I never knew that, in fact, you know, these are wealth, these are resources. And I think, for me, that's really my uh, new, uh, really, interest. How do we make people understand that, in fact, languages and cultures are resources, just as natural resources? And therefore, it's important to train a new generation and to incorporate it in our educational systems. In the same way, you need French if you go to France. In the same way, if you want to be an expert of China, you need to be able to access Chinese materials. In the same way, if you, you want to be an expert of America, American literature, American culture, you need to be able to read American texts. So I think we need to find a way to overcome this linguistic paradox. How is it that to become an expert of the Yoruba, you can you you are asked you were trained to speak English. <laughs> can you be taken seriously if you were claiming to be an expert of France without being able to read French or speak French? So I think this this double standard really needs to change, and I think the way to do it is really a fundamental reform uh, 
of our educational system. It doesn't mean rejecting all the languages, no. What it means is incorporating these languages and these cultures in our curriculum for several reasons. It creates new skills that are much needed to uh, in engage African traditions and African languages in knowledge production. It could be used to create, to create new social mobilities, resources. Okay? But, but there's, there's a huge market too for advertisement. There's a huge market in these, in these, in these areas. And I think we need to connect that to uh, economic growth, economic development, you know, because people have to real, you know, people have to be able to uh, understand that if you say, say, for example, if you, you you study these African languages, you have the skills, then you have also possibilities for social mobility. But that's a political issue. Um, until we're able to do that, until our governments are aware that these languages could be commodified, just as French has been commodified, just as English has been commodified, so that if somebody is going to Yoruba land to do research, well, Yoruba should be required for that person. If you go to France to do research, you can't do it in Yoruba. You're going to have to do it in French. And I think these are the, the issues I'm, I am really interested in. And I think that um, now with technology, initially there was a fear that technology was actually going to destroy African languages. We're actually seeing that actually it's the contrary. Technology is actually, actually now helping us really preserve some of these archives to, from being lost, but also revitalizing some of these languages that uh, were endangered. So I do hope that in our conversation, we will go in more details and how best to really create new uh, centers of learning of these, of these languages in Africa. Okay. So I will, so I will stop you. for now. No, no, but those are, those are very brilliant answers. I'm very grateful. Uh, because you are fascinated with history, I want to return you to history and then we'll move back to the contemporary period. I've been interested in what I call the cultural policies of some warriors and visionaries of the 19th century. They didn't use the word cultural policy. I framed it as such. And I've been trying to understand Shaka Zulu, Ahmad Bamba, and Amfudio. So what we now call Zulu identity emerge from some of the cultural policies of Shaka. And you see how that Zulu identity remains influential in South Africa, although the Zulu are 17% of the population. When I turn to Fodio, whom I've read in translated works, of course, the minority conquered the majority, but they adopted the language of the majority. So the Fulani speak Ausa. But when we go, when we now go to the area you know best, Ahmad Bamba, people don't know Ahmad Bamba as well as they should do. A young man, one of the most imaginative African writers, he wrote far more than anybody, both in the 18th and 19th century. And he did two things, both of which are connected to this topic. He said, you can be a Muslim, but you don't have to be an Arab, which is very fundamental because by saying that, it's basically saying you can be a Muslim, but you can edit out many of Arabic cultures. And he said fundamentally, and even at the level of the highest form of government, I've made this point that Ahmad Bamba said, why don't you approach identity via language instead of through ethnicity? And the way he frame his argument is, what do you become if you're able to speak Wolof? What do you become if you're able to, to, to speak Wolof? If say in Nigeria, those 250 groups frame the question, what do you become if you are able to speak Hausa or Yoruba? Maybe, this is just maybe, the, the kind of ethnicity, ethnic tensions that emerge will have taken a different turn. And I'm talking about, I'm not talking about contemporary scholars with PhD. I'm talking about my examples are those who had education via other means. Mm -hmm. In the case of Zulu indigenous epistemology, in the case of Fodio Arabic, 
in the case of Bamba, also Arabic, that he said, no, this is not going to work for Africans. Let's, let's rethink the process. So how will you respond to this challenge yeah. from an historian? Yeah, I think this is a very important question and highlights the relevance of archives. Because before uh, recently, the assumption is that relevant or good knowledge about Africa is to be found only in European languages. Now we're finding writings of Ahmed Obama, for example. We're finding writings of disciples of Ahmed Obama that tell us how and why Ahmed Obama reached those decisions. Ahmed Obama was born in a very turn, in a very agitated and tumultuous period of colonial colonization. He realized and he learned from history. Uh, he learned the uh, consequences of uh, uh, jihads in the, in the region. In fact, one of his own uh, family members were affect, you know, was affected by these violent uh, uh, revolts that uh, 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 occurred in that period. So he understood that this context is not a context that is prone for military fights. And he also understood social inequalities that he wanted to deal with, the caste-based system in world of society, how to deal with that. So he, Ahmed Obama's first, and I think that's very important that is often de-emphasized, Ahmed Obama's first mission was, from the archives that I have found, is to reform Islamic education itself. Ahmed Obama wanted to shift Islamic education from a book-based memorization to an ethical form of uh, learning. So that Amur Bamba emphasized ethics more than rituals. And that's because he realized for him, society was ill. And the best way to deal with the illness of society is to make, to train people who are ethical. So it's not really about praying five times a day, but it's about being a good person to your neighbor. <laughs> and he implemented that vision by de-emphasizing Arabization. For him, Islamization, Christianization, you could be a good Muslim and be a good Hausa and a good Wolof. These are not mutually exclusive. And that's partly because Ahmad Bamba also experienced the same uh, bigotry that, that's in the Arab world that, for example, uh, Martin Luther King and others experienced in the Christian context. So Ahmad Bamba was aware that, that race was also used in the Muslim world to create hierarchies where black people were at the bottom. And he rejected that in one of his first writings. So in terms of African, Pan-African thinking, I think Ahmadou Bamba is, is, an, is a key player because he understood that the challenge that black people and Africans in general were facing was a challenge of hegemony. But how do you train people who can survive and flourish and that's why he emphasized language. So the first thing he did was, you know, Ahmad Bamba was a universalist in many ways because he wanted to continue to engage the Arab world and his colleagues, the Muslims. But he told his senior followers who were writing in Arabic to shift and to write in the local languages. Because he thought Writing in the local languages, conveying his teaching to the masses could only be done realistically in the local languages. And in so doing, he elevated not only the local language, but local virtues. So one thing that I find, and I will stop there, that's interesting when you look at these archives, I, I'm always amazed by the fact that Amur Bamba was, uh, was so interested in, 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 in ethics that he even was a friend of drunkards. There was there is one if you if for those who have who know Senegal if you go to Jurbel you come to the cemetery you will see that the wall is crooked because apparently when he used to meditate in one tree there there used to be a drunkard uh, from my own ethnic group the Serer who would stop by late at night and Amur Bamba stayed for for weeks he didn't see the man and he asked his followers where is where is my friend. And they didn't know who he was talking, talking about. He insisted, and they said, oh, that drunkard who passes by here every night. They say, yeah. He said, yes. 
And they said, well, he, he's dead. We just buried him outside of the cemetery. He told them, break the wall and got him in. Because for him, what is important is ethics. And that person to him was an ethical person. Okay. And I think this is just a point to say this is not only unique to Ahmadou Bamba. This is a fundamental African virtue that you find in Hausa land, that you find in among the, you know, in East Africa. The virtue of humanity. Okay. And I think we're losing many things when we don't incorporate these texts. And that's why when I, you know, when I say when these people write, they're not writing because they're Muslim. They're not writing because they're Christian. They're writing because they're African and they're trying to address the, you know, the problems in their communities. And I think Amur Bamba is just one example. I'm sure you can find, you know, many other scholars in Niger, where my sister is from, you know, in Kenya and other places. We need to incorporate these voices. These voices have been, you know, excluded in our conversations about Africa. And, and I think the, the case of Ahmed Bamba is just one of, of many. So thank you very much for raising this issue. Thank you, Professor Falu. I will call you back um, later on. Meanwhile, let me introduce Professor Hussaini Alidu, who is going to be our next panelist. Um, is a, she's a distinguished professor of Umin letters in the School of Arts and Sciences, Rutgers University, in New Brunswick. She's appeared on this program on two previous occasions, and she previously served as the president of the African Studies Association, uh, having previously served as a vice president and a member of the board. She specializes on theoretical linguistics, gender, and African studies, in addition to related subject matters. She authored protest arts, gender and social change, fiction and popular songs, engaging modernity, Muslim women at the politics of agency, visual and virtual, inscribing language, literature and culture in Francophone Africa. And more recently, uh, a book forthcoming by University of Michigan Press. Welcome, uh, Professor Alidu. Thank thanks, you. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Good morning, um, ev everyone. It's a great honor to be uh, together. And uh, thank you so much for uh, yet again inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to be in dialogue with uh, my esteemed colleagues and brothers and the audience. Thank, thank you. Yeah. So let, let, thank you. Let me talk about silences. <laughs> the silences of women in this conversation, the silences around gender, the silences of many African languages, especially those described as minor ones. When we accumulate all these silences, what meaning can you create from them? Um, thank you so much, uh, Oga, for this uh, uh, important uh, um, question and starting with silence, because very often we don't talk about silence. We are looking for voice and for uh, writing. So, uh, once we have silence, it means erasure. Uh, it means erasure. It means uh, a lack of a recognition of the possibilities that existed and the potential that can be offered in the present and in the in the future. So the silence is uh, of of we, women's uh, knowledge production. And I want to uh, combine both uh, the argument that uh, Professor uh, Nagash has presented and Professor Ngong, my two brothers and uh, interlocutors over the years and decades, is to say if within the domain of epistemology, epistemology is uh, seen only as a, as a monopoly of men, then it means that humanity is not progressing the right way be because 
there is a whole body of knowledge system, a thought process that has been dismissed. So I cannot imagine how the cognitive process operates and also whether it is at the level of uh, creativity, innovations, one can imagine uh, moving forward once there is marginalization of uh, that body of, uh, of thinking, uh, whether it is uh, materialized uh, through writing systems. And here I'm, I'm saying epistemologies are not conveyed only through Latinization or through any script system, whether it is Ajami, whether it is Tifinar, whether it is Unko, or uh, epistemologies uh, are carried through several mode system. And women, uh, African women, uh, have contributed uh, to the production of ep epistemologies in their indigenous uh, uh, literacy systems, in the oralized forms, as well as in a forms that can be on other forms of canvas, whether it is the script, whether it is uh, the embodied forms, whether it is other uh, manifestations of ways of carrying thought processes. So now when we come to the question of uh, the literary, I think the groundbreaking works of uh, women writing Africa, the four volumes, uh, 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 tells us uh, uh, the gaps, both within not only uh, within the um, higher education systems in, uh, in, in the West, but in uh, the African sy systems as well, not to uh, create um, an environment where this body of knowledge and body of creativity uh, across uh, different regions of Africa uh, to present the work of, of women. But before, before the production of, uh, of the four volumes, uh, Women Writing Africa, uh, the, the Southern Africa region, the West Africa Sahel region, the Maghrib uh, re region, and the Central Africa region, there were uh, uh, other monographs, uh, including uh, important uh, works uh, by uh, Jean Boyd, M Beverly Mark, and... Uh, and uh, Sadia uh, in, uh, in Northern Nigeria on the works of uh, Nana Asmao. Uh, so I build on uh, uh, just uh, the comment that uh, uh, brother Professor uh, uh, Falun Gong uh, just made that uh, uh, Africanizing Ajami, uh, Africanizing Islamic philosophy, um, Individuals such as Nana Asmao and her grandmothers have done it and have written poetry. Uh, poetry, uh, not only in, uh, in Arabic, and in fact, the women were forward-looking in terms of saying multilingualism is a lingua franca in Africa. So even within the 4 system, the contribution of Nana Asmao in philosophizing about language policy vis-a-vis -vis education and language policy vis-a-vis -vis literary imagination and literary production. I think she has established that by, by uh, writing uh, uh, in a Hausa, in Fulfulde, in Arabic, in Tamajic. So if we're talking about modern African literary uh, uh, figures, we cannot escape establishing Nana Asmao as one of the foremothers of modern African literature in multilingualism and also creating an interlingual dialogue between writing system in the poetic and literary sense and philosophizing into that. It is through her work so if I'm looking at the writing in Ajami, it is through her work that we can say we have a sociology of women's contributions in, 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 that, in that geographical space. Because each poetry, as the works of her, uh, 
her scholars, such as uh, uh, um, Sadia Omar in Sokoto, uh, Jean Boyd, uh, uh, um, Jean Boyd and Beverly Mark, and uh, many others. Uh, the younger generation we have to count. Count. There is a whole body of works on uh, the uh, uh, this figure, who are looking at. Uh, what do we know about the contribution of African women who are coming from first ethnic background, whether they're Sorai, Zerma, whether they're uh, Fulani, whether they're Kanuri, whether they're uh, Hausa, whether they're Nupe, whether they're Yoruba, who have come and be part of the ecosystem. So her poetry gives us a window as a social biographer uh, of, 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 of that period. But uh, before that, when we look at uh, the contributions of, of we, women be, be, uh, in, in the Francophone space, uh, the Amazigh women, the Tuareg women, uh, had literacy in, uh, in Tifinga. And so if it had not been interrupted because of coloniality, uh, that literacy predates Arabic in that same geographic space. What would... Uh, uh, where would we have been today? So the revival of Tifinar, in fact, is not in the Maghrib. The revival of Tifinar, the resilience of Tifinar, and its association with women and men, and it, this is a script that is gendered because it is uh, women who trans, uh, tr uh, transmit uh, this literacy to both girls and boys, the grandmother, right? If Education has not been, uh, the, uh, we, you ask uh, a question about uh, cultural policy. The cultural policy of Tuareg people and Amazigh people is such that women are the transmitters, the custodian of literacy. However, with the interference of uh, European colonialism in the French system, it is total linguistics, uh, linguistic assimilation and dismissal of any literacy system, whether it is Ajami, whether it's Arabic or any system and the languages. So imagine something that a script that is so gendered, uh, that is uh, uh, transmitted by women to both women and men, now becomes completely dismissed in the Sahel and, and the Maghrib. What it would have been, as uh, uh, my colleague and brother Folu said, the first of all, uh, it, it script uh, in the modern period, more contemporary script that are non-Latinized, are we philosophize them constantly in relationship to religion, and so there is an imposition of relig relig religious conservatives on, on 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 the script, where whereas. If we analyze the body of archives in the long durée, we see that the communities that uh, where the script originated and what the communities wanted to do with that, they, they delinquent uh, to, to serve other purposes, like the commerce, like agriculture, medicinal plants, um, other uh, uh, relationship, the affective, uh, love letters, something that is not associated with Africans because of the system of coloniality, where it's it's so oppressive, it only stress that is imposed even in how Africa is depicted. And so psychologically, we also internalize uh, those of us who are operating within Western epistemologies. So it's very important that we decolonize the psychology that come uh, to be associated with how we understand the history of writing and the history of writing in the multiplicity of script system of Africa. Beyond just Arabic, beyond Tifinar, there is a uh, in, uh, uh, in in Cameroon, when uh, uh, Arabic script came, uh, this community in, uh, in Cameroon said, no, we have to create our own script. Inco also happens like that in, in, uh, in uh, the Mandang, right? But I wanted also, uh, since you talk about uh, uh, silence, for us uh, to say, uh, 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 in, in my own thinking and writing, I try to uh, resist hierarchizing writing 
writing through alphabetization through the scriptural, other forms of writing like orality, like uh, painting, like dance, the embodied forms of uh, literacy that signify something for the African worldview that uh, we are saying we have to decolonize the epistemic field. We have to decolonize the, the way we write and think and offer ways of translating uh, Africa. And how women, uh, when we look at uh, uh, women archives, when we look at women archives, both the ones that have been denied to exist and the one that they're producing, we are producing, that uh, uh, those uh, uh, borders, bo bo uh, borders uh, um, of interaction between uh, uh, the canvas through which knowledge is conveyed, women are resisting it. So for instance, uh, with modern technology, uh, now uh, uh, feminist decentering of uh, how we articulate the African experience from an African women's point of view. The scene filmmakers, documentary filmmakers are intervening and appropriating both um, the archives produced by coloniality and then the archives produced uh, outside uh, reference to coloniality and uh, and the silences, reinterpreting re silences. Their silences, as a, a Mar Marnia Lazarek, the Algerian sociologist said, silence is sometimes eloquent. So some silences are not a product of, a, of not being conscious that one is being under the pressure of coloniality or neo-colonialism from uh, the within. So, the eloquence of silence is to wait and see at which moment one speaks. So there is a form of agency in, in terms of when do we speak? When do we write? And how do we write? For which purpose? And for which temporality to achieve which goal? So when we look at closely how women writing operates, whether it is in the literary form or in other forms of fields, whether it is in sociology, whether it is in history, whether it is uh, in, a, in, a, in a medicine, uh, uh, in medical field, or in psychology. There are, there are different ways in which we as African women thinkers, whether we are operating within the Western epistemologies or we are operating in indigenous forms, uh, we see that there is di really different ways of uh, uh, translating the world. And uh, and so the anxiety that uh, uh, the last time we have a conversation with uh, Oyewumi Oyorange, who is uh, in the platform, and uh, our presidential uh, uh, keynote uh, 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 speaker, uh, Professor uh, Adironke Adesanya, pro made a provocation about AI and uh, about the place of the art and the dismissal of art increasingly in the curriculum, whether it's in the West, or in, uh, in Africa and the danger of it. And this is the site where African women um, produce forms of critical literacy, which challenges the notion of the, um, uh, uh, the implication of the Anthropocene, right? How is the human intervening, inscribing, mapping our forces into the ecology, right? How are women rewriting that through the different forms of literacy, whether it is the canvas of the artists like Professor Adiranke Adesanya, who are interested in the ecology and the question of uh, the, our impact on the environment, or the musicians who are producing um, uh, 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 texts that are interactive, that are uh, uh, multimodal, whether it is uh, the song is uh, pro produced, uh, uh, the po poetry is, is produced as a first uh, writing and then uh, sung and performed, dramatized. African women are intervening in all these spaces to say uh, there is no, we cannot afford to continue operating within a linear system of thinking or within a border thinking. It has to be interactive. And uh, we are contributing to that. 
So translation is operating. The dialogue between the diaspora, diasporic field, right? The diaspora uh, is another area where the writings of African women in the diaspora and conversation with African women on the continent become is very fascinating. If I take the work of uh, Chimamanda Adichie, Africa, Americana, it is speaking both to uh, the African woman and man in the diaspora and the African woman at home. And this has been also the conversation through the songs. When we go and look at the body of archives, what is the gift that grandmothers and mothers are, as their children are being yanked to them? They give them a song that they carry with them in the diaspora. The language we cry in is a famous, uh, has been a, a, a point of, uh, of uh, uh, research by scholars like Ivan, uh, uh, Ivor, who helped this uh, diasporic African woman in whose family the song is there to reconnect with her family in a across the Atlantic. But diaspora is not only the Atlantic. Diaspora, now we are talking about the diaspora in the Mediterranean diaspora, right? So those crossing and how women, uh, I'm teaching a no two novels that are very interesting uh, in uh, quite talking, uh, discussing how African women write the history of long durée and the place of women. This young uh, writer uh, who has become famous, uh, Ya Gassi of, of Ghana, homegoing, uh, wrote the novel based, she came to the US at age two and returned to Ghana through study abroad. And a visit to the castle and the dungeon has pushed her to rethink what it is to be the African and produce this historical novel. I'm going, right? So that is African library. The writer, uh, 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 the Nobel Peace, uh, uh, the, the Nobel uh, Laureate, uh, Abdurazak Gurna, writes the story of women, the African woman who, a character, whose partner, whose husband is from India. So uh, here we, we, we see that the Indian Ocean and Africa have reconstituted the Swahili land, right? Who we become. And it, he does a fabulous work by giving, uh, by, by, through the voices of these women in the narrative. So the silence is it, uh, uh, as a, as, so here again, uh, I see that novel as a feminist novel, which becomes aware that uh, ways of presenting African identity uh, um, um, have a gap because the idea of not developing the character the, of history as a female becomes problematic. And this other novel by, written by an, a young African woman uh, centered also the voices of this woman whose two children, one daughter becomes the character who marries the British man who is the master of the castle. And then her younger sister, same mother, is sent off as a, as a slave. So genealogy there. So how we speak, the silence, uh, the silence in the contemporary writing and how women intervene or do not intervene is a very critical in how we have to rethink the new curriculum and how we have to recuperate. So the, the, there is the question of restitution, language, script, epistemologies are filled of restitutions, but the restitutions uh, that are constituted uh, uh, as a, one of a, uh, a, a, a a brilliant, uh, a generous curator, uh, the famous uh, Azu Nombogo said, restitution should not be on, only 
a matter of presenting oneself uh, in front of TV and ceremony. Restitutions of uh, African cultural objects of value, of virtue, not value, virtue, must be framed within what uh, Brother Folu is saying, the ethical framework. And the question of women, what we miss by not uh, taking women seriously, respectfully, and realizing that the knowledge system that epistemology we're talking about and what we are yearning for, the present and future we want to create cannot happen if we have not restituted the right place of women's African women's contribution in history and in the present and in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very, very much. You've writ written a treatise there. I think we have to do the transcript and it will be a major read on silences and the intersection with other things. I'll bring you back. Meanwhile, it's my pleasure to go to South Africa to introduce our colleague, Professor Salau, Abiorun Salau, who has initiated a major center uh, in his university, University of the Northwest. It was a privilege when I was invited to give a series of lectures uh, at that center last summer and is doing a lot of great work. Um, it's not just um, a theoretician talking about languages. He's also used those languages for journalism, for films and for other things. He's a professor of journalism and communication and media studies. And he directs the Center for Indigenous Language Media in Africa, ILMA. He's taught, studied, research journalism, media and communication for over 30 years, working in various countries. He's contributed to print media organizations. He's published very widely, edited over a dozen books, and is presented at various places, including here in Austin, where he has given us some of his um, best presentation, the relationship between media and languages. And as the moment, He's been emphasizing the use of indigenous languages of media communication. Thank you very much, Professor Salau. Thank you, as, Prof. As you can see from my introduction, my interest is on this connection with the media. First of all, how do we archive many of these languages? And second, how do we use them for media engagement? In the case of South Africa, how do we make use of many of these indigenous languages as forms of communication? Well, um, not only in South Africa, um, than the entire continent, um, the indigenous languages, they are the languages that are I would say natural to the people <laughs> who own the languages. And as such, uh, they are the languages, you know, in which they, they feel more comfortable, you know, to, uh, to communicate with. Um, these languages, you know, can be used for different purposes, you know, not only in the, in the mass media, uh, as our research entities, you know, tries to emphasize, not only in the mass media, not only in the digital media, but even for uh, educational purposes, uh, the, uh, native languages, mother tongue, you know, have been, have, have been proven to be very effective. And there are a number of studies, you know, that have been done, you know, uh, about this in all over the world, you know, uh, the if, uh, six year uh, primary education, you know, uh, is there, led by uh, late Professor Babs Fafunwa, and uh, because of Bab and uh, some other colleagues there, 
And there are also uh, a number of studies like that, you know, even in South Africa, in Mali and all that, you know, which all, you know, point uh, to the fact that uh, uh, people learn better, you know, when they are taught in their, in their native languages, you know, in their indigenous languages. So uh, uh, these languages, you know, can be used there. And uh, the notion that African languages, you know, are not adequate, you know, to teach uh, technical not, uh, te te technical subject or science subject, you know, uh, has also been um, uh, disproved because, uh, as Ngugu Antiogo said, you know, I know that uh, a number of colleagues have mentioned Ngugu Antiogo, you know, in this conversation. Uh, no language is superior to another, and any language can be used uh, to achieve any purpose. Uh, probably, you know, our challenge, you know, in Africa is that uh, because of uh, uh, colonization, we we have not been able to develop our languages, you know, very well. Yeah, and and that is why you know, people will say that uh, those languages are not adequate uh, to teach science, you know, even even to uh, to use, you know, in higher education. Yeah, but the fact is that uh, if we intellectualize these languages, yeah, they will be used and very effectively. You know, for teaching in higher education, you know, for science and, and technology and, uh, and all that. So uh, that, to me, is uh, uh, is the way to go. Yeah, uh, because for instance, you know, if you look at a, a language like Afrikaans, you know, in South Africa, Afrikaans is used very well. You know, uh, uh, in higher education, you know, it's used to teach in the universities you know, in South Africa, and there are a lot of journals, you know, published you know, in Afrikaans. Yeah, and that's simply because the apartheid government, you know, uh, the former apartheid government in South Africa was able to uh, invest heavily, you know, in the development of that language. And therefore, you know, it is being used, you know, to do all these things, you no know, way are talking about. I don't want to believe that uh, even Swahili, you know, in East Africa, you know, to, uh, to a large extent, you know, is also able to, uh, to do some of these things we are talking about. So I believe that... Uh, uh, our languages are adequate, you know, to do all these things, you know, if only we can uh, intellectualize them, you know, if we can develop them very well. Thank you. What about the issue of archives? The issue of archives? Archives, uh, archives. Yeah. Sorry, Prof. The how do we archive these languages? Uh, oh, okay. Well, um, <laughs> well, the, 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 the I believe that all over Africa, you know, there are archives, you know, that have a document uh, produced, you know, in in African languages. Even though, as we said, you know, uh, colonialism, you know, affected us. And that is why you know you discover that uh, in most archives, you know, in 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 Africa, you know, not only in South Africa or Nigeria, what have you, yeah, uh, most documents, you know, in our archives are in the colonial languages. Yeah, I was reading something about Tanzania that uh, a lot of the archives in Tanzania are even in German, you know, in German language, and that was because you know the, uh, Tanzania, you know, was at a time under the uh, colonization of Germany. And so, because of this, you know, it becomes difficult to even access these archives because many people, you know, uh, uh, cannot understand German. They don't use German, you know, and all that in Tanzania now. Yeah, and that, you know, is also the case, you know, in many parts of Africa. You know, if you discover that in South Africa, you know, most of the documents in archives they are either in Afrikaans or English. Yeah, but uh, with uh, um, with freedom, you know, with the with the death of apartheid, so to say, uh, all the other official languages, you know, of, of South Africa, you know, are now being used, and you know, there are documents in them, you know, in archives, uh, languages like uh, Isi Zulu, Isi Kosa, Setswana, Sesotho, Shifenda, and, and all that. So it's a recent thing, yeah. But these things are coming up, uh, and I believe that uh, in Nigeria, you know, you find a lot of documents, yeah, that are either in Hausa or in Igbo or in Yoruba, you know, and Uh, we also believe that uh, in East Africa, particularly you know, in, in nations like Tanzania and probably Kenya, you find a lot of uh, uh, archival documents in Swahili, you know, and maybe some other uh, local languages of those countries. So um, the 
the, the languages are present you know, in the archives, but they are not as much as we would expect. Yeah, uh, but we believe that even with this age of uh, uh, digital technology, uh, more and more of this you know, will be done. Yeah, to, to have them, you know, not only you know in the in the physical form, not only to have this document in the physical form, but also you know in the digital form that you know people can uh, uh, can make use of, can access, you know, even in, in decades to come and centuries to come. Yeah, because. Uh, with the papers and all that, you know, there's a danger of them even being destroyed. Yeah, but uh, with the digital technology, you know, and all that, you know, some of these languages, you know, will, uh, will remain archived. You know, the document produced in these languages will remain archived. You know, that, that's what I believe. And uh, concerning the, uh, because my interest, you know, is actually in the media, concerning the newspapers, you know, produced in, you know, uh, in, in local languages, you know, Africa. So I believe that if you go to uh, University of Ibadan, the National Archives at the University of Ibadan, you know, you are going to find, you know, uh, a number of uh, newspapers, you know, uh, published during the colonial era, you know, in Yoruba language, for instance, there, yeah, you know, newspapers like Eleti of uh, Akede, you know, and all that, you know, and even some uh, some issues of Boom Boom, you know, that uh, uh, that was published, you know, uh, under the, the, the Font Daily Sketch Press Limited in Ibadan. So you you still find all these things there in, in the archive. But as we said, we cannot rule out uh, the effect of colonialism. So the uh, the bulk of the archival materials, you know, in Africa, they are still in these colonial languages, and that is the fact. So thank you. Can we use um, Africana to illustrate some of the points you are making? So they came to South Africa, try to create an, their own language, try to impose it, creating a crisis in Soweto. They used it up until the university level of Stellenbosch. Mm. What can we learn from that? The same thing in the state of Israel and Hebrew. Three countries in the last um, hundred years have all smaller than our people, than Yoruba people, than Fulani people, have shown how you can use your own language. As in the case of Africa, now you can even invent one and make it functional up till the university level. What is there for yeah. us to learn? Yeah, as I said, you know, uh, earlier, um, the idea, you know, is to invest heavily you know, in these uh, languages to intellectualize them, yeah, to uh, produce terminologies, you know, in them, you know, glossaries, you know, in, in them and all that. It requires a lot of hard work, you know, to be done by the linguists, you know, and other uh, specialists, you know, in the area of uh, language studies. Yeah, so because there is no, I don't think there's any magic about it. It's just that Africans was heavily invested in during the apartheid uh, era in South Africa, and that's it. Yeah, um, but I don't know uh, what is holding uh, the entire continent back, you know, from investing heavily, you know, in their own local languages. We know that there is this uh, problem of a colonial mentality, you know, we, we, we seem not to appreciate our languages again uh, in all spheres, you know, whether in education or in the media, you know, or in the judiciary and all that. So everything, you know, is now done in the, in the colonial languages in French or in English or in Portuguese and all that, yeah. So, but if we have the political will, you know, and the economic uh, power to do it, I know that it's very, it might be difficult because, you know, you also have to look at the political economy of, 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 of this thing. It might be very expensive, you know, imagine in Nigeria, you know, they say we have about uh, 400 languages, you know, in that country, yeah. Uh, it, it would be very expensive, you know, to try and develop all, the, all these funded languages, you know, and in, to invest, you know, in them, you know, so that uh, uh, they can be used, you know, for education, uh, for teaching in higher education, for sciences and all that. It would be very difficult. Even if you reduce uh, the languages, you know, uh, in Nigeria, for instance, to about uh, maybe 13 that people will say are major, okay? Uh, English, uh, sorry, Yoruba, Hausa, Igbo, uh, Ethic, TV, EBBO, you know, for full day and all that, it will still be uh, very expensive, yeah, to uh, to really develop all these languages, yeah. And the same thing, you know, uh, in South Africa, South Africa now has um, eleven official languages. That is, 
uh, besides English and Afrikaans. So the indigenous uh, African languages are also uh, used as uh, official languages, you know, in South Africa. But the fact remains that uh, this official, this uh, indigenous African languages, they are nine. You know, uh, does the government have the wherewithal, you know, to really develop uh, this all these uh, nine languages adequately? I know that it is doable. It's something that can be done, but you know, it's going to take some time, yeah, to really achieve that. Uh, no doubt, you know, Africans, you know, is still on the uh, in the forefront, um, and uh, I, I also believe that uh, even the uh, the Africaners, you know, they take a lot of a lot of pride in speaking their languages. You know, here in our university, here in, at the Northwest University, yeah, which uh, has a lot of uh, African influence. You know, you receive sometimes you receive some emails in Africans, and you begin to wonder what's wrong. I mean, do these people think everybody else speaks Africans? So it's what they are just used to, okay? And I believe that uh, maybe in some meetings, you know, if probably they think, they realize that they are in the majority, they are likely to be speaking Africans, you know, before, you know, they would then check themselves that, oh, there are people here, you know, who don't speak Africans. So they take a lot of pride, you know, um, uh, in their language, you know, and even the, their media, Either newspapers, you know, or radio, or what have you, you know, they are doing pretty well, yeah. Because they they take a lot of pride in their language. They use their language, you know, at a different fora, yeah. And when you just, when you also realize that uh, Wikipedia, you know, which is uh, which is said to be the uh, uh, the seventh uh, largest uh, uh, internet uh, uh, network, or so to say, you know, uh, has a lot of uh, Africans present. You know, because Wikipedia, you know, uh, uh, is in a number of languages in Africa, but it is the only the, the one in Africans that is actually supreme, where there are a lot of contributions. You know, the Africaners, you know, are contributing to that Wikipedia platform in their language. It is closely followed. It is sorry, not closely. It is <laughs> it is uh, distantly followed by Swahili. By Swahili and. Then you, know, you begin to ask the questions, what are the other major African languages, you know, what are they doing? You know, do, do we have much information, you know, about, you know, on Yoruba Wikipedia? Do we have much information on, on the Hausa Wikipedia? Do we have much information on a, um, uh, maybe a KQU, you know, a Kenya language, you know, a Wikipedia, okay? Or do we have much information on Zulu Wikipedia, you know, or Sesuana Wikipedia? Because our people are not, you know, really contributing. You know, we are not really promoting the language. We are not really using the language. And it is a major problem. Thank you. Let, let me go back to Nollywood and films, other films. How can we use Nollywood and other films to promote what you do and what other people do in the area of languages? Yeah, <laughs> of course, you know, uh, film, you know, is a, a major cultural product. Yeah, and uh, um, if well developed, you know, it has, you know, a very strong capacity of promoting our languages. Uh, we do know that uh, there have been quite, you know, uh, some efforts, you know, in this regard. There have been uh, a number of films, you know, produced, you know, in indigenous language, uh, in indigenous languages in Africa. Yeah, uh, I, I believe that uh, we know uh, some of the, even some of the latest work, some of the contemporary uh, films, you know, produced like Anikulaku, you know, in Yoruba language, like Jagun Jagun, you know, and, and there are many, you know, um, many of these, uh, many of these films, they are on Netflix. Yeah. And you know, even in South Africa, there are a lot of there are a lot of films you know produced you know uh, in Zulu, you know, in uh, Kosa and and all that, and uh, even a, a, a lot of a uh, uh, translation you know is done. A lot of subtitling is done. You know, if the films you know uh, are in English, you know, or what have you, you know, we see a lot of subtitling done. You know, just to promote uh, uh, the languages. And the one fascinating thing also, you know, in South Africa that. Uh, you know, a lot of their dramas, a lot of their films are multilingual. 
So you will see uh, uh, people speaking English, speak, uh, speaking Zulu, speaking Kosa, speaking Sesuana in one la in one field. Okay, so the idea, you know, is to reach to <laughs> as many people as possible. Yeah. So uh, film, you know, has a lot to do uh, in promoting the languages, but then. Uh, they, they need, they still need a lot of encouragement, you know, uh, because you know it's very expensive to produce films. So uh, we also say, say, say that the uh, government, you know, still has a role to play in this. Yeah, and I want to believe that uh, to some extent, you know, maybe the uh, the film commissions, you know, in various parts of Africa, you know, they must be doing uh, some things to promote the uh, to, to promote the indigenous language films. Yeah, but probably, you know, what we can say is that they need to do more. They need to do more uh, so that uh, uh, many more of these films can be produced. And the interesting part is that uh, uh, people really enjoy watching their local language films. And that is why, you know, compared to the print media, you know, the broadcast media, you know, do well, you know, in the use of local languages in Africa. Yeah, because... Uh, the, the fact still remains that uh, Africa is still largely, you know, an oral culture, and that that is why you know you find you know a lot of radio stations in local languages in Nigeria, in South Africa, in Tanzania, you know, elsewhere, you know, in uh, in Africa, there are a lot of radio stations in local languages, you know, and people listen to them even more, you know, than than they do, you know, to English uh, to English radio stations. So there's a lot of interest even in films, you know, in African languages. So all we can do, you know, is to uh, have government to encourage them, you know, to produce more, to produce more. And uh, even, you know, in our research entity, you know, uh, we also try, you know, to uh, to promote African language films. You know, currently now, you know, we have a, a special issue, you know, on African language films that we are we are publishing in the Journal of African Cinemas. Okay, so that, that's, you know, in a way, is also our own small contribution. Yeah, to, to uh, promote African language films. Thank you very much. We're going to bring you back and I hope many people will visit your center as I did, uh, where you are doing a lot of um, important work. And in your region, Botswana, Northwest, South Africa, Lesotho, you seem to have been united by the use of one language, one common African language. So hope is not totally lost. Uh, and your, your suggestion on investment is going to yield tremendous, um, tremendous reward because we have these larger areas in, in different parts of Africa where they are united by language. And this is one area we need to promote. We'll bring you back. Meanwhile, it's my pleasure to introduce um, John Mugane, Professor of Practice of African Languages and Cultures at Harvard. The last time we saw was at the airport while leaving the African Studies Association. And um, I'm glad you're doing well and flourishing. His research focuses on African languages and linguistics and he's been developing language program for a long time, since 2003, and creating the world's foremost African language program with more than 20 different languages taught each semester. It's a lot, a lot of work. And his center offers instructions and create resources on indigenous African languages, African pigeons and Creole, Creole, Sierra Leonean one, Cameroonian pigeon, Nigerian English. And just as we've done with the Jollof War, I think we also need a pigeon war. Which one is better? The Cameroonian pigeon or the Nigerian pigeon? Let's develop a warfare around those uh, and move these languages forward. Is well traveled, is done annual conferences at Harvard, in Bamako, in Conakry, and also in Nairobi. Uh, it's, it's, it's published widely, and his latest book, The Story of Swahili, published by Ohio University Press. 
welcome, my good friend, Professor John Mugani. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oga. Um, it's a pleasure indeed, since that time we found ourselves waiting for planes in an airport. I found you very gracious and generous. And uh, now that I've actually come conscious of this group and so on, I've, I've not, I'll not be missing. I was there before this one, and it's just uplifting. I would like to thank you for organizing this. And in fact, uh, it turns out to be like if I had a dream team, I wanted to have a conversation with these other people. Uh, we'll, we, have, we, we, can do it, we can do it again and again and again. So yes, let, let's, uh, start where, mm -hmm. let's start with the modern artificial intelligence, which is where we are now uh, in terms of um, updates and progress and things like that. So what are the, what, what do you think are its potentials and pitfalls of artificial intelligence? Professor, you should, I, I was expecting to warm up to the kinds of things that have been said here have been wonderful. I'll, 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 comment, I'll come to it. Uh, uh, I would like, first of all, to say we can't even talk about the AI yet until we really just recognize what was actually said here. And I see lots of, lots of things here. First of all, to just appreciate uh, my sister, Professor Alidu, because we were all finished brand new PhD students, we were walking around and looking for things. And uh, that's sounding now like the Stone Age time, you know, this time we've come this far. And the work is amazing that uh, that uh, I follow it all the time. And in fact, very, very proud of Professor Aridu, Professor Angom, of course, is my friend. We cross the river and meet. We have, and it's never floods, so we always can cross. And it's, uh, I say this, um, and also uh, recognizing Girmai, who we are with again together at Ohio University. We were colleagues there and had a lot of things to talk about. And so I can't just say, I can probably just say I endorse everything they say. They've spoken for me. They, they, I can't try to go and really explain the way things, uh, things the way they have done. So yes, I'll, I'll, I'll push the next step. But it is to recognize that, first of all, both uh, Professor Ngom and Professor Alidu have uh, have taken me to their country. I've been to these countries and I went to Niger, really, really fascinated by the place. Um, went to Mali as well, and then went to Senegal. And basically what I found there was very interesting and also very enlivening because everything I hear people saying about African languages, being marginalized, being all these things, is again telling a story that is actually not true. Uh, the fact that a few novels were not written in these particular places and so on doesn't mean they're not there. Actually, there are very many there. And in fact, uh, part of the work that I've seen uh, with uh, Professor Ngom doing with Ajami, he took me there and actually has almost bulldozed me actually to learn it as quickly as possible because of the knowledge. Then by doing that, I come up with a story of Swahili, which is saying nothing else other than the fact that it is an exceptional language. Exceptionalism meaning if you think about the big languages of the world, somebody called Nicholas Orstein has written about um, empires of the world. So he, he takes the big words, big, big languages, and the empires into themselves. There's a time French was spoken from the Russian court all the way across Europe and so on. These people have been ruling with, with these languages and so on. So they're writing about these things. And so these are big languages. When you add Swahili to it, why Swahili becomes remarkable here is that it is one of those languages that makes it to the 12th, to the top dozen languages that are spoken in this world. Now that's remarkable because the other 11 actually come from the empires of the world. But Swahili is coming in and it is actually, how did it make it to the 12, to the 12 people, you know, 12 languages and so on. And that's why you now start telling a very different story from the empires of the world. And my point here is not to actually go through it, by the way, the story of Swahili is completely free. The, the press has given it for free. So all you just need to do is go online and you can download it, you can see it. But the point, the point of it is the, the it says there is something that one can rise to these kinds of bolted places in this world, be an international language without having the wars, without having all these other things and so on. And what does what does that mean? It 
it is actually a whole other African Ubuntu kind of way of dealing with things. The story that Swahili was is actually a shipwrecked language from the Middle East is actually a lot of it nonsensical because the science of language, which is linguistics, reveals completely that all you have, in, if you go to a language and find lots of words that are not from there, they're from another part of the world, that's not evidence. That's just borrowings and so on. And in fact, if you have, if you just go to a kiosk in any African place, especially the very informal ones, you'll find, you get into that kiosk, you can find things from all over the world in that, in that, in that storage space. And that's a basis which I started out talking about the story of Swahili. Just went and looked around things and everything you picked up was a historical artifact you could tell a story with. So I started, I did that kind of thing. And um, it turned out to be actually a very, a very revealing thing. And the reason I raise it here is that Swahili has convinced me that actually a language is an archive unto itself. That, that basically when you look at Swahili, it, what it does is that instead of looking inside, it actually leads you to all the other languages, of the, uh, all the other places of the world. But it is also strategically placed in the Indian Ocean on the Indian Ocean, you know, littoral of, of Africa. And the Swahili, unlike the people inland, which is ourselves who are inland Africa, when they see the ocean, they run to it and walk on it and start doing things. A friend of mine, that water looks pretty scary. They just take a whole mouthful and put it in their mouths and spit it out and say, this is medicine. For them, when they see the ocean, it is an, it's just another frontier to go to. For the rest of us, it's actually you stop there and you, you stop, uh, you don't go in there. You'll hear people like the Maasai and the Somali and so on. If they're eaten, if they ever die in water and they're eaten by, that is the worst insult possible. You know, that they don't want to go there and so on. Whatever that all means. But the idea is language then, when you look into, it, it's in, in, into its insides, what makes that language? Actually, you call to order almost all languages of the world to this particular language. And so that tells you what is language like. Linguistics is a very clear theory. The thing we look for in linguistics is we say all languages have the same kinds of rules and, and notions. They are constituted the same way. And so language is not really the, the difficulty thing. And in fact, most of the people who speak Swahili are not Swahili native speakers. They have actually come to learn it because of its circumstances and so on. So having said all this, uh, the interest uh, that that I see with with uh, with talking about AI is first of all to recognize, to look at our languages with a clear lens, not the one that actually is being fed to us. The idea that languages are not being used in places, that they are not actually available in literatures and all these, those are niche things that we were talking about. The question is very clear. If you go to Nigeria and indeed that you can find 400 languages, or Cameroon that you can find 300. And I say indeed if you can, because when I went to Cameroon and told them, I am so happy to be here. I hear you are second only to Nigeria with 300. And I said, I don't even understand the geography. Nigeria has 400 languages and you cross the border. They have the same border and you find 300 in the other one, 700 languages. Wow, that is quite a bit of something. Then these guys tell me they were the, um, they're the regional group there that actually deals, uh, deals is I think they are, um, I will remember the, the, the actual, it's a lot of N's and C's and all the other, it's, it's, a, it's a group that actually talks about these languages. And they told me, professors, you've done well to come and tell us about these things. You tell us where these 300 are. You show them to us. And that's where you start understanding what we don't want to do is we don't want to go and say, this is a language, let's build it by itself. That's not what we're going to do. What are the Cameroonians saying? They're saying, I have linguistic repertoires. I can walk across these places and go speaking these languages. And all these, so our languages have been alive and well, except now I said have been because with the coming of TikToks and all these other things, I've seen with a little worry that Africans are speaking more English and better. They're doing all this and the younger generation, in my country being above 15, you are a senior citizen because the, the, other, the other people are actually down there with just coming up and growing. These languages are endangered in a big way, because if they are not spoken, then they are just going to disappear. We were saying Yoruba cannot go anywhere. Not Neither can Zulu go anywhere. There are so many of them and all the other stuff. Then you go looking at the demographies and they probably you can see it exiting and so on. So that's, that's all going in that direction to say that basically we should give an honest view that our languages are being used. But what they are not doing is that they are not in that realm that uh, 
of Salidu was talking about and also um, and has been mentioned even even uh, Salawan is saying these languages can are all over the place and and cannot be developed all at the same time in Africa we are very famous we fail language exams through the continent there is a time in fact the absurdity was that the person who actually uh, was number one in Swahili in Tanzania was from China now one can start celebrating and it's not so long ago then you start saying my goodness, these people are very smart. They came and beat us. No, they are doing an exam. This is called an app, right? So if you, if it's an app, you can only you can actually just talk the thing you want, and then the app will fix it for that language for 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 whatever the proper Swahili and it goes there. I want to use that, even though uh, it is actually been brought out there. I want to use that to actually say then, what is the lot of our languages with the AI? AI is showing, and and I have evidence of it a little bit here and there because I've seen some work happening. You take a language and you speak, so you speak your language and the other person hears their language. What is this going on? Now, not not everything is ready right now. Actually, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of um, machine learning, machine training, and so on. And at first I was skeptical because I saw how the Swahili developed and it was really terrible. You would see people trying to speak it and all the, uh, trying to use that stuff to actually do things in Swahili, it wasn't working. All of a sudden, um, it improved. And now people I know who are translating books, who are the Swahili speakers that I recognize, and if you want to know where Swahili is spoken, you try to go to Tanzania and try to win an argument speaking Swahili. You'll be chewed in five minutes and they'll, throw, they'll spit you out. But if you go with English, everybody will be so quiet listening to the big speech, whatever. And a few then will also be trying to listen in. The idea is that if that is, so that being the case, with these languages that we actually have, if I can speak my language and you hear uh, Igbo over there or Yoruba or you hear Wolof and so on, and do you speak back and I hear mine, uh, what that means is basically then that the future professor is not going to be telling us, uh, well, we're not going to be going and be told we have to write in English. We have to write in French and so on. The absurdity is that Ngugiwa Thiongo um, a great person has said all the time that you cannot write Chinese literature in Isizulu and say this is written in Isizulu but it's Chinese. Now those problems are disappearing because they're always fake problems that we were just be we were just being streamlined into using other people's languages like because these other ones are not accessible. Now what's happening is that in the university of the future with AI, these languages being translatable the way they have actually come about that you can speak your own language and actually write your paper on whatever it is that you want. And when I send it to you, Prof, it arrives to you in the language you select. This, this business that failed us all from East Africa, South Africa, all the way to West Africa, that if you fail to write this thing, they call the general paper in English. And, and let's say about a weekend that you wrote in form five and six, and if you did not pass that paper, it doesn't matter how you did in the disciplines. You didn't go to the university. These are crimes, basically. And so there are many, many more to say. But the point is that now you will be able to actually speak what you want, finish it, and then send it to the professor. It will not be like Ohio. When I arrived, my professor gave me a B plus because he said, the, I said, what did I miss? And all the, and by the way, I was very happy. I was from Africa. B plus was the king of the universe. And I was told I was actually not doing very well. Then it, it turns out that every time I, a spelled things wrong. He actually removed a point. <laughs> so in the end, I ended up with this kind of way. So spelling has been part of that design of actually teaching us. Now, I've seen all these things happening, and in fact, there is a there is there is the fact that it is not that is not intelligence. The idea that you spelled right, you spelled wrong, and so on. But it was used all the time. In fact, you know, people have been punished a lot for it. Just like I said with those high school things before you go to the university. So now what I'm expecting to happen is basically that I will write my, uh, I'll write my, I, uh, I'll write my papers uh, in the language that I want. You read it in the way you want and so on. And therefore language, the idea of, of, of saying that now this is a language of literature is not going to be happening. What does that mean to all these literatures that we have that are underground? What does that happen to, you know, with all the kind of things we were talking about here saying, 
uh, we will get academia to speak, we will get everybody to speak this set of languages in order for us to actually learn. Uh, it will actually be saying, no, you bring in your language. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean everybody arrives at the same time. Like right now, Swahili looks like it's ahead. There are some, I'm look, I mean, I'm aware of some work going on with Wolof, Fulani, Somali, Kikuyu, Kimeru, and, and, and a few others that actually is revealing that the very magical thing that, like I'm talking right now as I'm talking, uh, and I talk in Gikuyu, it transcribes and it can tell me in any language that I want. Now the question becomes, okay, is how accurate is it? And all those other things, those have to be sorted out. But the idea that this language bar is going to be with us the whole time doesn't actually make a lot of sense. And remember, the Tower of Babel, the story that we actually hear, was not an indictment against multiple languages. It was against the, the, the idea of one. These people are speaking one language and they were agreeing a lot uh, on whatever it is that they were supposed to be doing. The reverse is actually true. That I mean, the, the idea is that you speak many languages, then we have the problem of trying to understand each other so that we get this thing we call Ubuntu, that you do not have the vocality only. So my, my particular drill on this is to say, we can say more about AI and even describe it more, but the idea is that uh, it won't be that our hands will be tied to certain to certain kinds of limitations that actually would be going on. So in the end, uh, we expect that uh, these places we call the schools, the hospitals, uh, the courts, and all those other things that are so much dependent on these tra on these translations are things we need to consider. We are not saying our languages are not actually working when you go to hospital or even the courts. I am. I am very interested in the courtrooms because that's where I'm trying to really get things going because people get incarcerated for failing to actually understand, for, for actually being in the court and they didn't understand what was done or what was said to them. Now, in Kenya, if you go look, the laws, they, they are published online. You can go see and you go search English as, a, as an issue and you find lots of repeats of cases, uh, some of them being thrown out because the person did not understand, did not understand English. And... I was telling some of them that if indeed in Kenya one has to have a B to go to the law school, that's the English they trust and above, then I was saying anybody goes to court and says, Yon, I had a C minus. I don't think I'm following these things. But what, what the translations have been in the past is you find somebody in the street who speaks the language you think it is, you bring them in. And so what they're translating is not really the proceedings. They're just saying, okay, he didn't punch him. Now, these ones say this and all the other stuff, which has been impractical in terms of the way people do things. So the idea that African life runs on the Western model of expecting to use uh, the notions out there is not useful. And in fact, the last thing I'll actually say on this point is that we have to distinguish between languages of communications and the language of thought. Now, language is 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 an instrument of thought. Now that's Chomsky saying, and he was saying this in contradiction to Aristotle, who was saying you associate language with sound. So sound in language is association of sound with meaning. Now, that's not the debate I'm interested in here. But the idea is that when we are doing so if I if I say I do the Ifa religion, which is a big thing and in fact very interesting, and I have a piece of that archive with me because of some somebody went there and actually filmed it and actually has it all there and all that um the 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 if a religion itself being in this language um it cannot um I, I forget what the sense that I actually want to make with it is but um the difference between language language as as a, as a thought Yes. So the thing is that when this person, when when you have um, the production, that, that's the point I'm trying to get, the production of information and ideas in African languages that ends up being in Europe. So for instance, the scenario here is that we are told that the best published publications that are done, that are available, 3% are from Africa. The rest are not from Africa. And those Africa, by the way, you can you can count them between Texas where you are, the Bay Area, and this place, and you can find where these others, these 3% probably came from. So in Africa, people are producing lots of data and sending it out there and trying to use it to actually get 
uh, things that that will actually to get to make sense of uh, of 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 the work that they are doing over there. But in the end, uh, that does not actually go out there. So, my point is that the language of thought is the one in the data. So the data collection part is a language of thought. Then we have the Kenyan constitution, the South African constitution, and so on. We all discussed it under a tree, talking our languages. When we finish discussing it, we come to the language of communication, which is English. Translate it into, translate out into English and we send that out. Somebody was telling me, but English then is an African language. It is serving Africans. And I'm saying, no, it is doing broad daylight theft. All the ideas came from our languages. You can't do or do if, uh, uh, whatever without knowing Yoruba. In fact, that's a malpractice. So when you when you so then you say, by the way, uh, this is data I collected, and so now when I'm doing the analysis, and it is always a point whereby someone will reach and say, uh, this is where the big interpreters Hegel and Foucault and so on come in to actually explain what this is all about, and that's where the rub is for me that. There is no such thing as African languages uh, not being alive and well, and actually they're doing lots of things. We do everything with them. The problem is that when we come to this niche area of publications and schoolwork, it becomes these other things. But if AI does what it is supposed to do, we will learn our physics. And in fact, I've seen some people already trying to teach physics in our languages. One was done by a student of ours here from, of Gala language, went and taught physics. And by the time she was done, they understood it. They took the exams. If they didn't get it, they didn't get it because of missing a detail. They did not get it because of sitting back. And and this experiment, um, you know, done in in Gala, there is an old one from uh, from Nigeria, which was done by Ayobamboche and and company, my good friend. And basically, they revealed if you teach people in their own language and teach them English as a foreign language, and you do all those permutations like this, those ones outperformed everybody else who try who try to learn in these other systems. The evidence has been there, but they've never taken it. But AI is coming to say very soon, um, at least with some of the major languages, maybe in, I don't know how long, we'll end up in this kind of situation. I am sorry for combining such a mouthful, but this was what I could actually say. No, 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 I really love it. I really love it. And... Um... You could see I was trying to move to the present and then move back uh, in time. So in its connection with migration and nationalist projects, people like Trump, conservatives in some countries like Australia are saying, why are you here if you don't want to speak English? What, and recently, Trump made his outrageous statement. He's, he's always making many of them. Why are they speaking their languages that they cannot understand? So, in his connection to globalization and migration, what do you expect will happen? to Yoruba, to, to Kikuyu, to Swahili, as people leave Africa to come to Western societies. So uh, one thing about the, the person you talked about, he called our languages the asshole languages. You know, they were, you know, the worst, uh, you know, they were just, and I, I had everybody writing to me and said, well, there is your program. Um, all that you're doing is, is these things. And that that is politics and and you know and all that stuff. But in terms of uh, people living in foreign lands, sometimes our hope, in fact, it's looking like when people go abroad, they do get a bit conscious of what they are actually not doing back there. If they are elite people, if they are elite families, uh, but and so when when people migrate, they can actually. No, one thing is that I'm not a very big. I don't argue big about people changing languages by walking with their feet. If you go abroad and you marry somebody else from somewhere else and you have these families you're making, that's wonderful. That's not an issue in terms of these things. But um, when we have situations like we have here, one of the AI benefits that is going to be here is that all these populations here uh, that come as, as, uh, as new immigrants or they're here and they have to go to hospitals. You remember, at hosp in, all, in all places of, treatment here, there is always a list of languages. If you need a language, here is a list we have. And if you don't have one, we'll find it. 
Here they are very conscious about the necessity of one's initial, one's own language, native language, in, in matters of health, in matters of court representation. I've been to some of them, called to court to actually you know, translate for people who are having issues and so on. So all these things are happening there. And so they will, when you migrate here, you know, it is the children we raise here that maybe start to actually separate, but there's still a population that is actually migratory and it's actually benefiting from these things. The issue of people, of whole population losing, whole, whole populations losing their languages would have to be an interesting one because I don't see much lost in terms of the available people speaking languages. What worries me is the demography. Because if if we bring our parents here, they are all speaking this and they're all over the place. We, you know, they are coming and going and so on. And so um the if a language dies, the, the death of people walked away from it, then we have to worry about other things and so on. But my interest now coming to archives is that we have to define archives, and I will be happy to hear what my colleagues say, to define archives not the way they are defined usually in terms of um particular you know, slots and, and physical objects and so on. We cannot do those things. What we need to do, for instance, to bring, when your migrants come here and my son or your grandchild, after they have been here three iterations and now they are totally Americans, they get hungry because they have us in them. They will actually have this feeling of, I want to go back to this land. Like we are already getting African-Americans to come to Africa already. You have seen that. They are, they are welcome and they are going to this place. Then you say, I want to learn. My people spoke X language. They spoke Kosa, they spoke uh, Chichewa, and all of a sudden, none of us exist to actually teach these languages, or maybe the ones that are, are alive are so old and so on. I leave this as an experiment, which I think might succeed if we get the right archives of data and conversations and people talking and all these other things. If we have those, a child does not is never taught languages. A, a child catches them by hearing them in use and so on, and so. My imagination, because AI, you can't even imagine enough with AI, the kinds of things they're talking about. But if a language is there, it means then we can actually have these languages available uh, in technological situations whereby they are not going to disappear because if ChatGPT doesn't have African information right now, so we have to actually get African information in ChatGPT. But if our information is there, and it turns out the Chinese person is hearing Chichewa dead, Chichewa information through their language and the Chichewa person is hearing theirs, there is absolutely no reason why anybody wants to quit their language other than for touristic sakes and so on. And in Africa, I don't know that you have, Prof, whether you've ever met an African in Africa traveling, confessing they are going to another African country to learn a language. I never seen them, never found them. Unless, of course, you're coming from a, from a, an institution that tells them to do that. I remember in my year, the poor folks in my class doing French could not go to France. There was no money, so they were taken to Rwanda. And it ended up being a very big laughing matter for a while because they did not go to where they expected to be. But if it turns out, you can hear your language and I hear mine. And you can hear the one of that, of these people we hear, we had people in Africa who have discovered big things of how to do things with, you know, making planes, making cars and all these things. They don't have vocality. So what they expect, what they wait for is for us to go with a few dollars, uh, take the data. They tell us whatever they do, we take it in that data. Then when we come to a point, we translate it to English, it goes to sell by mega bucks and all the other stuff. So one of the things that will allow us to do is that we will revisit the literature written when AI is done. And now we'll go read those papers again. What were these people saying in these languages? Because now we can talk to each other and so on. AI, and I'm not promoting it to say that I'm very excited about it, that it's a wonderful thing, but I'm just saying our hands are not going to remain as tied as they are in terms of speaking English and speaking French and all the other stuff. And by the way, like it was said before, people in, this, in, the, in these other countries, Germany started complaining. There is no German in German literature. They are all learning it in English. The French started saying, they were actually on NPR saying, if you take somebody's language, you take them, whatever and they say. I started laughing out loud. You said, we've been saying this all this time and so on. Because AU does not, no, EU, EU does not write much in anything else other than in English. So they were complaining, write it in French as well. But the idea, the eternal life of language is never with those formal things people do. It is actually with the generations that come. And people will say, one of these days with luxury, because I like um, I learned German, for instance, for graduate school and so on. 
but I've also gone and become a good friend of the Nko people. I have been with them for a while. And so one of the things is to learn how to write and how to actually speak Bamanakan. And it turned out I didn't even have a big thing to do. I went there and somebody was talking to somebody and I heard them there they were saying it. it sounded exactly like Ikuyu and I did it. I said, Wetao. Then somebody says, oh, Togo Bubak. I said, wait a minute. Even the greeting already is the same kind of thing. Now, the thing is, though, is a tricky part is we write it. If it is spoken, it sounds like mine, but when it's written, you can't recognize. But the idea is that now languages become these permeable spaces that, that actually are going to be of benefit to us. When I go somewhere and find an old, in Mali, I had a lot of trouble. Find these wonderful people who want to talk to you, but I had to get a translator in between. And you can hear them stopping and then making sure that they are telling me the right stuff and so on. So, so yeah, Prof, um, I don't, I, I see a future with these languages. And also in other things like domains of religion and so on, they say um, the, that in Christianity, the gospel will be, will be preached to every people, land and nation in, every, in, in their tongues. And then the end will come. Uh, I didn't think it was actually happening, but now everybody can actually be reached in terms of some of these languages, looking towards the the results that I've actually seen that actually you could really uh, hear your language and somebody else speaks another. Thank you. Please, we'll now bring all the panelists back, all of them. Um, Bayo, can you spotlight all the panelists? Thank you. You are missing two people. I've seen the two people, yes. One more person, please. Thank you, thank you. Please, can you do conversation among yourself. Are there are points of disagreement. Uh, I know that Professor Mugane said he agrees with everything you've said. That is very unusual in the academy. <laughs> you have to disagree. Is, is there any major point of disagreement? No disagreement? Yes, no, please. No, not a disagreement, but sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Please. So, no, no, not a disagreement, but really some, some kind of uh, uh, comments here and there. Uh, I, I forgot, uh, with your permission, uh, uh, Professor, I, for, I forgot to thank and uh, say greetings uh, to, to my friends and colleagues because I kind of I was beginning, so I was thinking about the time more. So uh, thank you very much. I'm very deeply, deeply, deeply uh, grateful for everything um, you have been doing in the past and, and today this conversation as well. So some of the things, some of the things uh, uh, probably for, for kind of responding to this, it seems to me from everything I have heard today, it seems to me still uh, that the in the in the I started with the post-structuralist, so I'm going to use some language there. Uh, I think in the in the global order of things, it seems to me that Africa is still positioned on what I would call the liminal space, uh, liminal space, epistemic, linguistic, and archival. Uh, although there are good news here and there, we are still kind of uh, uh, not 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 far away from there. And here are my kind of uh, I think pushback a little bit. Uh, I am concerned about, for example, very much aware uh, about our own, this includes myself, uh, but I'm trying to, to be a little bit, um, to distance myself from, from, from this, to, to, from subjectivity. Uh, I'm still, I was listening to, to, to uh, my sister, Sena. Uh, so the decoloniality, the, the kind of the, uh, epistemological formations is still still kind of very very much gender based in Africa. Uh, in terms of representation, I s uh, often try to include, for example, writers by by women writers. It's kind of the, the, it's a subconscious thing, uh, but probably also not not enough sufficient material available around me. So the, the gender dimension. 
uh, also Sena kind of uh, intimated something about this anthropocentric uh, way of thinking in Africa. We are not really dealing. Uh, we are not really dealing with 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 our environment as adequately as we would have wished to see. Uh, we are kind of talking in the old modernist say. Uh, uh, paternalistic or patriarchal way, I think it's very much, very much the old uh, story of modernity still that we have. Uh, so uh, there is there is concern about about the liminal. I mean, it's not a concern, but this is a fact. I think for from from my point of view, uh, Africa's uh, liminal space positionality in terms of production of knowledge, in terms of the language and the archival. The archival, uh, I guess. Um, it is out there because it is inscribed, embodied in the languages, in the, in the conversations and the monuments and so on and so forth. I think the problem we have is, uh, here are some of the things. There are variations in context, but when your presidential archives are stored in English and French or something, what does this say about the sovereignty of your of your nation, of your culture. What does what does what does this mean really? And to my understanding, the archival, some of them, including the, the, the presidential uh, archives, are not actually even stored in Africa, but they are kind of you know in deposits and so on and so forth. Nothing against that. You can have a backup double copies and so on and so forth. But the heart of the matter is uh, the archives of the EU, the presidential archives in many African countries are not available even in translation in the languages in the big in the language in the in the local language that is really a, a concern while this is actually part of the paradox like my brother john was was, was signifying saying uh african languages are there they are used by politicians by the elite and so on when they are conversing for political office right but the moment they don't need it they move on uh, this is this is very nicely described. I don't I don't, I don't remember the date, but by Mam, uh, Mahmoud uh, uh, Mamdani's book called Citizenship uh, and Subject. So as Africans go and talk in the local languages, but their communication and that is really where the bread is, where the interest seems to me is, then they shift to the global languages. The 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 the, the, the problem for me, as I see it, as I understand it, is we could do more in with translation. The, the European languages are there. They are not going to go. Why should they go? They are part of uh, you know of, of Africa now. That's not that's not an issue even for me. But we could we could do more with the local languages. We could incorporate them and 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 and, and, and use them. If you allow me, I have also something like to say. I think um, uh, a little bit of the of the of the uh, this is. Uh, Another comment, the African elite, uh, the political, the cultural, the academics, the intellectuals, uh, it seems somebody has said this, but it is my own observation as well, do not seem to have a very keen interest in terms of reviving uh, uh, the local languages and indigenous knowledge systems. And if you think very carefully about it, why should they? Because education has been really colonial, near colonial. Uh, it is not deliberately to destroy the languages. It is not deliberately to do harm to the local languages, including, for example, Ajami or Greece or Tigrinya or Maharik and so on and so forth. But it is, the, I think, the, the, the wanting to uh, imitate the bigger project because people are uh, a little bit, I think, um, conditioned into thinking. This is what I need in order to advance myself in, in, in society. I'll, I'll kind of uh, uh, finish with uh, probably the last point is uh, maybe, maybe uh, we need more to be more creative, intellectual in, intellectualizing the language and the cultures and a lot can happen. Uh, but I am going to suggest, for example, uh, moving forward, uh, more production in African languages 
in connection with the cultures and history and so on and so forth. Like, for example, you could have sister channels in African languages. This could be, this. you could have an extension of sister uh, channels that have a similar program like, like, like this one, for, for example, with focus on languages, but maybe more on regionally specific issues. It could be gender, it could be religion, it could be other things because Africa is 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 kind of unified, connected over over, over issues, but there are also kind of I think distinctions within with, 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 within the unity. Uh, uh, I believe I have to stop here also uh, to make uh, uh, to give time and space for for my friends and colleagues. Thank you so much. Professor Ngom, you wanted to to respond to a challenge. Go ahead. Unmute yourself. Uh, Technical people are muting. Can okay. you talk? Yeah. So thank you very much. I, I don't really have any uh, differences of view. I just want to uh, hit on a few points uh, as a result of listening to uh, uh, the uh, wonderful contribution. So there's one thing that I see as a common theme uh, that parallels our natural resources. So our African languages are actually regarded as raw materials, really, to be extracted in the same way our raw materials are extracted and processed elsewhere. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that, for example, Africans themselves and African scholars themselves who work in these languages are more traditionally treated as informants, as people providing the raw material not really the people who will be doing the analysis part. I think that's really what we need to change, right? You know, because until we're able to, until we see these African languages, just as, you know, the natural resources we have, that they need to be developed and, 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 and extracted, but also processed locally, right? I think we, you know, we, we, we're facing a big challenge. I think overall, which means then, we need to find ways to really incorporate African languages as resources in our institutions. How to do that? Clearly, there's a political dimension there. You know, uh, I remember one time I raised a question to uh, the former uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Senegalese Foreign Affairs. I said, but why is Ajami not recognized as literacy? And why are people not treating Wolof as a legitimate official language? He said, well, we would all become illiterate. <laughs> Meaning the 20% of people who were living in these countries would actually, you know, turn illiterate just the next day because their competence in the local languages is very low. So there is a political issue here, but I think it's important to really highlight the relevance that actually these African languages that have been belittled are actually resources. The resource is just as important as other resources. And that multilingualism is a resource to the country. So if a Yoruba speaker speaks Hausa, speaks Zulu, speaks Wolof, but that's that's that those are resources for that person. So they can they can potentially translate, they could potentially engage in diplomacy, in, they could do a lot of things. And I think that's really something that we haven't emphasized the relevance of these African languages as resources that could be commodified, you know, because we, if we're not able to connect the relevance of African languages to create social mobility, it's gonna be a challenge for people to embrace them, okay? So that's the first point. The, last, the other point that I wanted, and I think that's about epistemology that has been talked about. It is so important that we normalize the studies of important players in our communities, writers, Nana Asmao, Usman Danfugio, uh, Amadou Bamba, and others. Because, because these are the people who have created models for our societies. And I think one thing that, that I think is so important, why is it so normal that we can, if you are in the Francophone world, you're going to have to know about Descartes and Voltaire. But you don't even know that you have a Musaka next door. You have a, you know, a Samba Mombeya among the Futa Jalon. 
I think these need to be central in our curriculum in the same way they're central in the Euro, Euro, European framework. So our students, and I think that's really one of the biggest challenges we face, they know more about Europe than they know about themselves. And therefore, the traditions of humanism, and I, and I, I want to end there, that I find that cuts across really, if you look at deeply in, in the African traditions, the African humanism that is reflected, say, for example, in Ahmed Bamba's teaching that emphasizes ethics, and as the example I gave with that uh, person, the drunkard who died, you find the same teaching across communities, whether they're Muslim and non-Muslim in African traditions. I think these need to be incorporated in our knowledge production, you know, because the way we're operating, the epistemological tradition that is guiding us is actually forcing into us paradigms that do not exist. Let's take, for example, the multimodal operation that our sister talked about, a poem. A poem is could be a text recited and performed. Is this an oral document? Is this a written document? It's both. It's both in our context. So orality and written literacy are not mutually exclusive. They're complementary. Just in the same way, religion and secular are complementary. These are not mutually exclusive. But we can't know our own epistemologies of complementarity rather than difference if we do not really engage our languages and our sources. And I think that's really very important. If we're really going to make our languages relevant in the 21st century, we're going to have to find ways to make them relevant for the new generation as ways of social mobility but also a way to root them so they understand themselves. And finally, it is so sad that our ethnic differences, our religious differences, cannot be addressed because we're not using our languages and cultures. So, for example, imagine, and I learned this again from my experience in St. Louis. Um, I have my colleague here, Professor Ba from University Gaston Berger. When I was there, it was so interesting when I began to use data from the classroom, from the students who came from Kazamas, who were non-Muslim, and who came from the North, and using data from their languages to study the knowledge systems in these communities. It brought the students together. It diffused ethnic tensions. Everyone became very interested in the other languages. And, 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 and I think that's the kind of tradition that we really need to emphasize so that we can emphasize the African humanism. Right? That, I think, could help to diffuse religious extremism, ethnic you know, uh, conflict that are often used politically uh, by politicians to create problems in our, in our African uh, countries. So, so, I, so I just wanted to, to, to emphasize the need to emphasize these relevances and, and, and to incorporate it in the knowledge system. And finally, I can't finish without touching on the diaspora. So we now find archives of African language text written either in Ajimi or in classical Warsh-based Arabic script across the Americas. So these are also areas of expansions of the continuities of African traditions. In one document that I found that was produced in 18, uh, 1789, so the, the year of the French Revolution, by an African slave in Brazil, I found the same epistemology as the one I found in Casamas not long ago, because the person was using the same prayer, the same incantation, calling on the same jinn, the same spirit, as a tool for spiritual resistance. So I think we now have ways to really uh, create new areas of research that bridge Africa, Africans in the diaspora and Africans who have been displaced <laughs> centuries ago using archival texts in ways that has not been done before. Again, just to emphasize why these African languages are so important, you know, both for Africans in the continent, but also connecting, bridging Africans who have been displaced outside of Africa for, for centuries. So, thank, thank you. you. I can now bring in members of the audience if you want to ask questions while waiting for them. I want to pose a question to our distinguished members. Isn't it that power and languages tend to be connected, that 
So Latin was successful because of the Roman Empire. French used to be global because it established some dominance. English because of Western hegemonic power. That's a proposition. But if that proposition is validated in terms of the connection between power and languages, what then happens to languages where the nation states and those who speak them don't have power? Any of you can answer the question, please. If I attempt, <laughs> if I attempt to actually say something, it's not to answer the question, Prof. Your question is is itself loaded with lots of uh, uh, lots of uh, information and so on. But the the languages that I think looking at the future of them and also the way they are coming around, um, they they continue to exist because of the kinds of things that I think uh, <coughs> Dr. Ngoma has talked about, uh, that um, you get people connected and solve problems using these languages to make them to make them living. Um, but um, the way we exist is that we actually are just leaving them uh, to stay astray. So, um, I think there is there is need there for us actually to be able to talk about the sorts of um, archival work we should be doing, or the, the way we should actually maintain uh, some of these languages, uh, because um, they are still available and they're still alive with us, and they are still going on. Um, I pause there for a minute as I as I ponder a few other things, but uh, what is being said here is really critical in. Uh, in a lot of the ways we have actually looked at languages and their vital importance in what we are doing. But I would like to add to a two comment, if I may. Um, so uh, language as a uh, brother, Professor uh, Ngom said, must be considered as a, as a natural resource. And we know that we are in a geopolitics where the ex extractivism um, has been part of uh, coloniality and neocolonialism. That's one. But the question is, what is the ethical responsibilities of African elite to think of our engagement towards Africa, whether Africa on the continent and the role of Africa outside the continent, and to renegotiate the question of uh, the political economy of language industry, publishing industry. What does it mean when we let go of that dimension in how we think of Africa in our negotiation with the rest of the world, whether it is uh, the Western world or whether it is in the BRICS? Because now, more and more, it is not only, we are not only do, dealing in the geopolitics, we are not only dealing with global north, but we are also emerging with uh, the BRICS, with its own hierarchical structure, right? So uh, that is uh, very important. So language industry and language as political economy, the translation industry, is all part of that. And we have to think of Africa being the site of one of the youngest demographics. So when we do econometry and its relationship to demography and the power of, uh, of language in terms of economics, we as consumers and also as those who are in the creative field and the scientific field, it is very critical. We just have to look at, at one point, Singapore, Korea, and even China uh, was in, uh, were in position where their languages were not spoken about. But today, when you come, even in, a, in our American uh, settings, 
The young people, when they're taking courses in languages, they want to go to Korea. Why? Because of popular culture. I even find some uh, student, I thought they were taking Chinese, but these are Chinese students now turning to Korean languages because of uh, the value. If you look at language as a, as a resource and, and empower it with value, like Professor uh, Salau also mentioned it, right? What is uh, how uh, we intellectualize them, but how we give them value and how we create language as uh, the site of uh, African self-confidence, Africa not only on the continent, but Africa in the world and with the world. That becomes critical. And I want to uh, seize this opportunity uh, uh, to celebrate within the continent, there are cultural, uh, 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 cultural figures who have advanced the study of African languages, the dissemination of African languages, the use of, like the creation of African Language Academy by Professor Basam Seku in Mali, who just passed away recently. I think it is an honorable institution that he has created that build the confidence and that shows leadership for African leaders and African commoners across the field to see pride in the legacy that that institution is about. So we are forever thankful to him. But there is a question of economics and the language, the, uh, how uh, policies, language policies, not only vis-a-vis -vis education, but vis-a-vis -vis econ economics. Professor Sal uh, Salahu mentioned um, how we have to invest and how the investment must be, uh, uh, how, how we rethink African economics in relationship to languages. We have to add value. Nollywood has done it. I said it, uh, uh, Nigeria was propelled to Africa number one economy, not only because of uh, mineral uh, uh, oil economy, but Nollywood, the creative industry has done it. I want to mention another uh, 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 case. In Niger, the Department of Linguistics was created in a similar, with a similar philosophy as what was done in East Africa to try to promote uh, when uh, the, the revolution that uh, uh, Professor Ngugi and uh, uh, his contemporaries have promoted the use of the creation of a department of African languages. Some of us are product of that initiative. It takes leadership. It takes the African elite to decolonize, as Professor uh, uh, Nagesh said, uh, uh, said uh, earlier. So uh, to build African confidence, so it's not even a question of coloniality. It is what Africans are offering in, in, in the world arena. So tra translation uh, is, is a translation in terms of uh, exchange. Exchange, what, what are we bringing in, right? So we bring uh, part of our heritage as a uh, resources, but not in a colonial way. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Alon Tobauju. You want to post a question or make a comment? <coughs> Professor Alon Tobauju from um, Adekunle Ajasi University in Nigeria, I think that's where you're based. Are you there? I'm there. Okay, yes, you... thank you very much, sir. Um, um, I, I, I'm really very uh, enthused by the excellent presentations of the Are members. Gonna... I am very grateful. Um, sir. Can we see you? Oh. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Right. I'll try to show my face. Can you spotlight? Uh, okay. Um, okay, the, the host is not allowing me to, um, please continue, please continue. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I think uh, my, my take off point, uh, with due respect to the panels is, um, from that initial question about, uh, 
the argument between language and literature. And it's important because quite a number of the recommendations uh, that we have uh, have to do with literature. Uh, that is, produce more literature uh, in the indigenous languages, uh, intellectualize the language, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, Professor Mugani uh, made a recommendation, I think, uh, to the effect that something like um, uh, linguistic Pentecostalism, you know, using machines where you speak and everybody hears what you're saying. Uh, but I, I think the question that really arises, and I, I, I think Professor Palola uh, related to that when he asked that question about what do you do when you don't have power? And that is very important because uh, uh, the linguist Wayne Rich did say, or uh, popularized the saying that a dialect is a language with an army and a navy. So what that means is that you need substantial force or some forms of persuasion to be able to make your, to globalize your language, or at least to make it uh, viable even within your own, uh, even within your own state. So that leads to the question of policy. What's the role of policy in all of this? Uh, we all know that the English language or whichever language did not get their prominence through refloating the language, but through policies that made them compulsory and so on and so forth. So what's the role of policy? And I think that's one question that I have. Um, if, if I may, I'll, I'll go to another question, which is about the future. Uh, can we really say, let the future take care of itself? Uh, is, that, is, is that a viable policy in attempting to promote uh, languages? I'm asking this because there was a talk about people in diaspora, for example. And we know that the West opens its doors to uh, the brainiest people to come, but they are not targeting these people really. They are targeting the future generation. They're targeting their children uh, who will no longer understand any indigenous African languages, who will, not be, who will not want to go back to Africa and things like that. That's their target. So can we leave even um, those in Africa uh, on the continent? Can we allow a free fall of the languages and say they will fend for themselves if they cannot be economically sustained? That's it. Uh, what happens to identity? What happens to pride? And so on. So these are the two questions that I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take one more question and then they can anyone can answer. Let's take one question for now. Stan, Stan Munshu. Apologies if I do not pronounce your name very well. Stan Moncho. Stan is not there. So why waiting for any it member is, of the, yes? Prof, is, is there maybe, you know, uh, the technician needs to unmute him. They will have located him. Stan, why waiting for him to be located? So, <clears throat> pedagogy, how does recruiting someone just to teach languages, how does it work with the structure of the academy? Uh, if you create mainstream departments like history and English, and you now say your own job is to service them by teaching those who are interested in research languages. How does that work? Is that not a devaluation by itself? Uh, how can we rethink that very structure in which language teaching is very well integrated into mainstream disciplines. Anyone can check this, this up. Yes, go ahead, please. Professor Falu, go ahead. Professor Falu? 
Oh, I was muted. Yeah, we, we do that deliberately to avoid Zoom bombing and things okay. like that. So that's a, that's an important question. Uh, um, so should I add, try to answer Professor uh, Olarun? Please, go ahead, okay. go ahead. So the issue of language and power, I think that's an important one. And I think that's a really a political decision. But I think it has, if, let's take Rwanda, okay? That decided, okay, English is now our official language because it's important. It's a language of business. It took political will. It took political power, and it works. But so in many parts of Africa, particularly in Francophone Africa, I think there is no political will to do so. And the problem is that if there is no political will to do so, then the economic value and the virtue value that my sister talked about cannot be you know, uh, incorporated in the knowledge system, in educational system or the knowledge system. But I think, just imagine, a government decides our lingua franca is Wolof. If an NGO is going to come to work here, they need Wolof. There are Wolof classes they can take. Okay, They need, at least in their program, Wolof so they can engage people directly. They make it a requirement. Just as people would make a requirement if you're going to France, you're going to send people who speak French if they're diplomats. Right? So, but these are these are bold political positions that have to be taken so that these languages can be turned into commodities that could create social mobility. Okay? I am more optimistic for Anglophone Africa and less optimistic for Franco Fran Francophone Africa. Okay? But I think it takes bold decisions and I think it could work. And just to wrap up on that issue, when I was director of the African Studies Center, I had the uh, uh, opportunity to oversee uh, uh, about $1 million for the study of uh, African languages, FLAS, fellowships. And we would send uh, students overseas in the summer to study intensive uh, African languages, so Wolof, Hausa, uh, Kiswahili, Yoruba, etc. In Frank, in the Francophone world, there was no infrastructure to capture this money. So, if I was to send someone to study Wolof in Senegal, there was no infrastructure that 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 knew the regulations, the number of hours. The, there were no professional structures to capture. $5,000 for seven week of six to eight week of instruction. In East Africa, there was already an infrastructure to capture the money <laughs> for Swahili. Okay, so you can clearly see one part in one part of Africa, <laughs> language has been commodified. The University of Dar es Salaam and in Kenya, they had, they had institutions that understood the requirement for intermediate level, advanced level, how many hours, how to capture the funds. In Francophone Africa, I had to help. And even with that help, it did not work because you know, people were not aware that actually a language teacher could be wealthier than a university professor if it's done well. So, so when I talk about when I talk about really commodification of language, it, it, you know, it's tangible. As resources, these languages are resources, and they can be transformed into resources. But it takes really, you know, political political will. And on the second point, uh, before I conclude, language teaching in academia, and how do we make language teaching relevant to other disciplines? Right? How do how do we create relevance? I think there are two things. I think that we need to take language skills and cultural skills as additional skills beyond our disciplinary training. In other words, if we have a PhD in linguistics, or we have a PhD in history, or we have a PhD in other disciplines, right? the language skills we have should be additional resources that we have so that we can publish in those areas, drawing from the knowledge we have of these languages. So that we're not only perceived as, you know, informant, training uh, expert and specialist, so that we are ourselves specialists who produce new generations 
but who also contribute to knowledge production. And I think the tradition is that because African languages have been devalued, many language teachers have been boxed into lecturer positions and areas where they regarded as doing less than say people who are doing linguistics, theoretical linguistics or history or geography, you know, et cetera. So we need to make sure to, to treat language as an additional resource that can allow us to enhance our disciplinary training. And I think by doing that, we, you know, we, 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 we really, we will motivate a new generation uh, because they won't see themselves that when if they become a wall of teacher, that's it. There is no social mobility. But they will see that wall of teaching or how they teaching those skills are directly linked to the disciplines. They could publish in those areas. Will, 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 will it be possible to make them into combined honors, like say, Yoruba nursing degrees, Swahili chemistry? For those of you who have very inserted into this. Can't we push for this kind of proposal that you can do history Zulu as a degree program? Does anybody want to take that on? I would like to come in here. Uh, so, you. all right. Go so, ahead. Uh, uh, I think about uh, in. Um, I agree with 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 uh, with uh, the founders' comments. I I, I think uh, I'm co going kind of speak to the, to the question. Uh, the question of power and the languages, which has which is related to the production of knowledge and colonization, all the things we have been talking about, right? Uh, we can be very desperate, skeptical, right? Kind of bitter about these things. But I would say we cannot afford it. Some people have talked about, for example, African languages using the language of linguicism, which is derived from racism, so they have been racialized and so on and so forth. Uh, some others have, uh, 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 I think that was Kutna was something, John will remember more than I do, uh, something like linguicide, uh, in a kind of very dramatic, unfortunate, tragic, horrible language. I myself have said uh, some years ago, uh, probably that is languages and development, probably that is the missing link. Probably, probably. I'm not a sociologist, I'm an academic, uh, I do cultural studies and so on and so forth, but I think probably that is the missing link. Uh, I say the missing link because language has also to do uh, which we did not really address today, uh, with, with dignity. If you read in Gugi and others as well, this, this language, is, if he spoke a local African language, I didn't have that experience growing, unfortunately, but if in other many parts of Africa, you were called a donkey, you were placed at something like stupid, all this stigmatization is there. There is a psychological trauma with African languages. So we need to be patient. Uh, this sounds kind of too, too kind of, I, I think, idealistic, but take it for what it is. Uh, this is a long-term painful, painful cultural work. Uh, we, we, we need to, we need to, we need in the diaspora, for example, African languages are in the institutions, in the universities. That is a wonderful opportunity for us. We can, we can work with our, with, with our colleagues in other departments. Uh, you know, Department of Linguistics and so on and so forth. Whoever is working with African languages, I think we should we should integrate that into content and work with other units and departments. That is one front. Simultaneously, I would say we have also to push, to push really lobby through conversation, through 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 dialogue. Uh, this decolonial uh, dialogue, I think, actually is 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 good. We are just starting it. Uh, we have to push, we have to take it to, to the higher kind of corridors of power. Uh, but uh, it, it is not, it will not be a, a, an, 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 an easy kind of, of work. Last last comment I'm going to make is probably most of us who are gathered here know a book called A Question of Power that was written by Bessie Head a long time ago, I think in, she wrote it in, in, in Botswana. I'll be very brief about this. 
It is about gender. It's about mental health. It's about dis disability. It's about apartheid. All these things that kind of, you know, um, plague the continent. We should also think about these things. This is a question of power. Now we are talking about gender. This is related to gender. This is related to environment. We have to create alliances, so to speak, with these groups also to empower the languages. Do you know? I think most of you are members. I remember there is an association called Association uh, of Language Teachers, ALTA, right? Do we have ALTA in Africa? I don't know. There is an association, of course, African Literature Association. Do we have an equivalent or something like that in Africa? Professor uh, 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 asked me a very difficult question. I tried kind of to, ma to, to navigate myself out of that about the Nobel Prize thing. Uh, yeah, we lament about these things, but Nobel Prize uh, is, is a Norwegian institution that is composite. It's not even diverse by people. I'm not going to resent that. Can we have something, a major prize for our writers, intellectuals, and thinkers as well? I think these are the kind of questions we need to, to, to think uh, about and work uh, and work uh, with, with those ideas. I will stop there. Thank you. Some so, people uh, want to ask questions. I don't know whether it's our technical people not highlighting them. Uh, Professor Mugani? No, I just wanted to go to the pedagogy part and say I have a unique situation in which been able to teach 50 languages. We have um, somewhere close to 30 something sections going on in these languages and so on. But the trick here is not that there is some magic going on. It is actually the faculty here in our department decided that this is extremely important that you can't study Africa without having a conversation with an African. And they, some of the people might say that they are not even the profession themselves, but they could see the value of it. So when I when I got here to hear about this this thing, it was that basically, how many languages? Uh, I was asking how many languages do you want to teach? Because most institutions in these countries who are doing any of these languages, it's it's less than ten languages if you are lucky, and so on. Mainly three, four, and so on. But then I realized the difference. I had been at Stanford before several years back, and I tried there to talk about languages, and they were saying, one semester for the engineers, then they go and do their science. Say they're going to go build bridges, they're going to build dams, and so on. That didn't work over there. But when I came here, they actually talked about this being the requirement. And so, to build a program whereby actually now you have to have as many people as you're talking about, uh, this is where the challenge comes. And of course, uh, they are very brilliant people. And so one of the things one does then is they, somebody may know language, but may not know the area content, especially uh, there are some big languages you'll find everybody. If it's Hausa, we find them. If it's uh, uh, big languages, we find them. But remember, out of all the languages you're talking about in Africa, I mean, in the world, I say the other day, 97% of all languages are spoken by 4% of, no, 97% of languages are spoken by 4% of the people. And vice versa, whereby you know, 97% of uh, people speak only 4% of those languages. In other words, if you go to our continent and look for numbers, only about 70 languages in Africa out of the 2,000, if you can count them that way, have more than 1 million people. The rest are just smaller and smaller and smaller. So if you decide, like some of my people have done here, is saying, I want to do Oshikonyama. It is out there in Namibia, and I and, and then we don't know where somebody is. We've been very inventive about it, but you have to be in a particular place that is almost like a turnstile where you have a lot of people in the area who are very educated and so on. Then those are the ones you actually would uh, be able to, to register to work with certain people. But it's not the idea of go have tea in a restaurant and actually learn. It is actually a, a class and so on. I understood that. And of course, the the things like compensations and so on are other things. But you're right, Professor, in the sense that anybody who teaches language in this country, not just even African ones, this is supposed to be the lowest rank of of people with remunerations and other things. Literature departments are controlling. I came to this place and I was asked why do teachers try to teach literature 
they're making students not love literature. They should actually teach them just languages and then they come to literature. But when they go to the literature path, all of them disappear. They went to do, uh, they went to these countries and so on. So they said the teachers are not teaching well. Then we went to meetings. And so you have to fight all these things. And if you are in a place whereby all languages are together, then you become a little, a little person because the others are having thousands of students. You come and say we are teaching five people all of. Uh, three people, this and the other, it becomes a different thing. There are challenges, but here one could do that. But the big thing that makes it happen is that professors here would actually meet students and they would say, the first thing you should do, I miss doing it, is go find John Mugan in that department and learn an African language. So somebody elevated tells them, go do it. Stanford was the other way around. They were saying engineers can actually know how to greet, but then they're building a bridge. They'll be there six months, they're coming back. And so here, the fact that faculty would go out there and that even the language can, is written on the diploma itself. And if you do a citation, it's actually written there, Ibo, Yoruba, Swahili, whatever. Uh, these are things that actually build. In terms of renumerations of these people, they are, their skills that actually are going to be, depending on what some circumstances, it actually pays a certain way. So, but the, the issues of payments and all those are not really the critical thing. It is that you have faculty who, are saying that this is this is actually critical. Then the others who actually say this is, we are wasting time and so on. The big thing it proves is that languages are learnable and they are being learned by, in in very in in very good circumstances. Now that uh, saying all that, it is actually to agree uh, with Professor Girmai that um, there has to be action that we actually do. And one of the things I was wondering about since uh, we've come this far is among us here. Could we even have a minute to say what kind of archives we could do? What kind of action maybe we can think about? Because uh, I would love to hear what it is that we would actually come up with. Because I've worked with Falungom. I know he has uh, some online. Uh, I have asked DL as well, as Africa Sources of Knowledge Digital Library that we're actually trying to put out there. But uh, we need uh, these multi-media um, kind of environments that we'll actually do. And then the other part, that is about um, these languages are, are going to be whatever they are. We'll see what uh, that part of the AI does. If, if at all, you can actually then communicate with somebody else without necessarily speaking their language. Um, it's going to be like Africa, where you actually speak some some level. Uh, there is only so much I can do in one language, and then as I stay with those people, I keep learning them because the methodology, the pe the pedagogy of teaching languages is not what modern languages are made it to be. Ours has to be the one that is actually social engagement. If somebody's sitting down somewhere, sitting and trying to, to learn a language, they should actually be thinking, about, they should stop that and just go, try to build a bridge with a community, try to build a water well. Uh, and this has happened as experiments that test themselves. People have gone to Tanzania and other places, volunteered in HIV AIDS clinics, others public, you know, in other things. And they come back, they speak the language, but they don't know why, how it is working. They know, they know how to say all oh, this is all. Then the part of the university becomes the idea of explaining the grammars and so on. So that in English, the word this is, is really just this car, this car, or whatever it is, this is. But in other languages, it will be that. It will change all the time depending on things. And they didn't understand why. They come back and they start understanding these things because they came from, from practice and, and being able to speak it, then they come to make sense of it. It's like a native speaker. A native speaker speaks their language, but they can't tell you how it's working. They tell you that's wrong, that's right, and another thing. So there is a little hope in the way you engage people to learn languages, if it is actually one that is of doing things with people and, and doing things that are, are scholarly in other ways, instead of just the learning of languages and so on. But yes, the, the work is doable and these languages are learnable. Uh, Professor Negash, isn't it possible to create courses on um, African languages and epistemologies at the undergraduate level? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it's a question of resources, but African languages and epistemologies, uh, a, a course could be very, very easily created. And I'm going to give uh, uh, this is a challenge, I think, <laughs> to uh, to you. To, uh, uh, some of the things that uh, take away from this could be create sister channels in African languages or combine this with what John is saying, uh, use uh, uh, artificial intelligence, you know, 
resources and kind of uh, do translation of the same version, uh, but um, localized regional channels, something like this, which would be linked to this to this to this channel, would be really uh, a wonderful idea. Uh, but yes, as, uh, I would, I did not speak about about uh, what is happening in Ethiopia. I mean, the resources in Ethiopia and Eritrea. Uh, but those countries, as you know, because of this, uh, which is compared to Latin, you know, the classical language of of Ethiopia and Eritrea, um, the archives there are just amazing. It's just kind of it's a lot, plenty, plenty, plenty. Uh, starting from the from from the translation of of, of, of the Bible and before it, it is I mean, the, um, the literature is there. Uh, people read even in the diaspora. Uh, I don't know if I, I can tilt it, but I'm not going to do it. Like, here here are, here are on my right books. You can see like I don't know plenty of them waiting for me to read, and these are novels and poetry that that are produced in the diaspora. Uh, people are writing uh, philosophies. There are encyclopedias even about. Uh, there are books like "Who Is Who." Uh, I have written uh, uh, many, many articles. I, I have to say since my childhood, but I have written uh, books in 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 my language in Tigrinya. It is and it's philosophical. You can read it. Some of them are in translation, um, including ideas about the freedom of speech and, and that kind of thing. Uh, it, it's it's quite very, very doable. Uh, but what helped also these languages, not to make them so special, it's the history context that made them like that, right? There was little, uh, say, say, contact, colonial contact in Ethiopia, hardly, in Eritrea also short-lived, but these languages were all already there as a substratum of the culture uh, so that's the history. There is nothing to boast about it. It's, it's just the history. It's history made us who we are now. Uh, but it is it is possible through translation both ways. Uh, you know, kind of uh, it it would be resources. But to be to to kind of to answer your question, yes, it would be very very doable to 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 kind of have courses, curriculum, and so on in African languages related to epistemologies. Absolutely. Professor Salau. Is it not possible to turn your center into a hub? A hub that will connect three countries. Since you, you are two hours away from Botswana, for instance, can we not do many of these things as collaborative projects? Yeah, okay, Prof. Even before I go into that, I think I would like to answer, you know, uh, the second question of Professor Lawrence of Aoju, they are talking about the future of uh, African languages, whether we should uh, answer off, <laughs> whether we should uh, just let them to have a free fall. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Yeah, but then it still all boils down to this issue of political will, you know, which has been spoken about a lot, you know, here during this conversation. Yeah, um, it, is, it, it is tied to policy. Yeah, we may have some of these policies, like I know in, in Nigeria, for instance, the uh, language uh, uh, policy, you know, in education, you know, says that uh, um, people should be taught, you know, in their mother tongue. You know, the first three years of primary education should be in, in the mother tongue. You know, all the subjects, you know, should be taught. Yeah, and I believe that uh, people of my own generation went through that kind of education. And I don't want to believe that uh, anybody of my age, you know, uh, who was in Nigeria at that time, you know, would not be able to write, for instance, Yoruba and read it. Yeah, but the, the case is, is quite different now. This policy is, is no longer being, uh, being implemented, you know, particularly with the, uh, with the avalanche of uh, uh, private uh, nursery and primary schools that we have in the country now. Yeah, and of course, you know, the society also does not encourage it. Parents, you know, want their children, you know, to be taught in English, you know, or even right from the womb. <laughs> so they want them to start speaking English. So uh, it's a big of a problem. So, but if the government has the political will, you know, I think uh, it is something that is doable. You know, we just have to put it, you know, uh, on, on the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you know we need to encourage people who, who are even studying African languages. 
because you discover that uh, in, in most of uh, African language departments, you know, in uh, in Nigeria, in, uh, you know, and in Africa, in other African countries, hardly will you find people applying to study African languages, either Yoruba or Hausa or anything. So it is a big challenge, and uh, there's a way government can incentivize this for people, you know, to study it, you know, and, you know, if, if they see, you know, we have, we have talked, we have talked, we have spoken a lot about commodification of languages in here. Yeah, if they see there's, there's economic value, you know, uh, in those languages, people will, will want to study. I know in South Africa, you know, um, government tries to encourage, you know, the study of this language, they give uh, bursaries, generous bursaries, you know, to, to students, you know, studying African languages in South Africa. But then, that also has not really changed the, the, the landscape, but it has helped. And I believe that uh, if the same thing, you know, is applied, you know, in other um, African countries, you know, perhaps, you know, things might be a bit uh, better. And uh, one other thing, you know, is to also push these languages, you know, uh, to be used, you know, in various domains, particularly the media, particularly the media. I said earlier on that uh, um, uh, the radio, very very well you know it's using african languages there are a lot of um radio stations you know using african languages and they are the the most popular among african people okay so but then we cannot neglect you know the issue of the print as well i know that um digital media you know has taken has taken over the print now people people hardly read you know the the hard copy newspaper, the physical newspapers again. Everybody logs uh, log on to the internet to read their to read their news. Then you know we should take it to, to the to, to the digital platform. Take the languages there. Let you know the um, the African language newspapers. You know, let them have digital version. You know, thank God. You know, Alaroye newspaper in Nigeria. You know, <laughs> which I'm very familiar with, is now on the digital platform. You know, it has a digital uh, version. Uh, Isole Zoe here in South Africa has a digital platform. Uh, yeah. And then uh, many other uh, South African, uh, like Ilanga also, okay, is also on the internet. So if we keep these languages, you know, uh, on the digital platform, which is, uh, which seems to be that the, what our younger people embrace now, these languages, you know, will continue to remain alive. That's my thinking. Yeah. So we are not going to give up. So we keep pushing. And uh, just to respond to a small uh, question that uh, uh, Prof Professor Negas, you know, uh, asked, there are language uh, teachers associations, you know, in Africa. You know, I know in South Africa, there is ALASA, you know, A-L-A-S-A, -A -A, that's African Language Association of South Africa. And also in Nigeria, yeah, there is a, a national association for Nigerian languages, okay? And there are also, Association for the for for specific languages like Yoruba, for instance, how vibrant they are, I cannot tell, but I do know that they exist. Yeah, thank you. And to okay. go back to uh, the uh, the question that uh, Prof. Lola asked, well, you know, it is possible. Uh, and the one thing you know about our center is that uh, we are not just focusing on the South African languages. We call it indigenous language media in Africa. We didn't say indigenous language media in South Africa. And we have students, you know, who have come from various parts of Africa, you know, from Zimbabwe, you know, from Nigeria, from uh, uh, Malawi, you know, and all that, you know, and, if, and also from South Africa, you know, who are studying, you know, uh, for their masters, their PhD, even postdoctoral fellows, yeah, from various, uh, uh, in fact, uh, currently now we are hosting somebody from Pakistan, you know, an Asian, and all he's doing, you know, is to do it, is to do comparative studies, you know, you know, between Asia language and the uh, South African language. Yeah, so th that's what he's doing. So we are open, you know, to collaboration. But uh, even currently now, we are embracing all African languages. You know, uh, as long as uh, we have uh, students who are interested in studying them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, let's begin to wind down because you've been we've been here for three hours so in the in in after 1948 when african universities were created and they began to flourish they did well in the area of languages and history and sociology and geography at some point we created leading centers in social sciences and geography 
So there are some areas where with very limited resources, African universities can lead and can be the best in the world. And I think in areas of languages, our universities can provide tremendous leadership. Geography was successful at one point. History was very successful at one point. So perhaps when we meet again with our African colleagues, we may begin to say, how do we shift the full energy back to Africa in terms of the areas where we can control? We can be less competitive in computer science. I can understand that. We can be less competitive in areas of robotic science. I can understand that. But we should be the center of the world in Yoruba languages, in the German languages because the resources are there for us to lead uh, in advancing the projects of these languages. And I think it may be a conversation we have to, we have, to have. And now those are two and those in the diaspora, we collaborate in terms of empowering, say, Chikanta Diop University in Senegal, Oh, University of Ife, Ife that um, Professor Mogana sp spoke about. And instead of us receiving PhD students here to train them, it's from here we'll be sending PhD students there to train. So the media is here. If you have last statement to make, because it's, they also, we have newspaper people and TV people, so you can use this opportunity to send a message that they will now relate to their public. Any message, I've just sent one now in terms of shifting the center of language studies back to Africa. If you have a media statement you want to make so that they can report it back to the various countries, uh, you can make your closing statement. Anyone can go. Yes, please. Closing statement, Professor Falu. They will unmute you. Go ahead. Please unmute Professor Falu. You can oh. talk now. Yes. Yeah, I, I, my closing statement is. The Uh, my, my closing statement is just to reassert the importance of treating our languages in the same way we treat our natural resources. And that these languages, you know, and for everybody. So if your house uh, speaking Yoruba is an added value for you. If your wall of speaking Pula is an added value for you. These languages are resources as important as our own natural resources. And therefore, they should be protected, preserved, and developed within Africa, rather than you know, following the traditional extractive approach of, of, of knowledge production. So that's really my last point, that we should look at our languages as important pathways into our knowledge systems, into our value systems. And, and they are resources that are important, just as you know, minerals that we have in our lands. Uh, are people on the ground not already doing that? So let me give you an example. If you live in Kano and you want to use what is called traditional medicine, you are going to go to the Yoruba person. If it's not available, you go to a Tuareg. So that you want to take that medicine as an example. If And part of what we don't do, they revive the older route Sundiata, Mansamusa, to the area of Oyo Empire. Those have been revived as we speak. They've revived the use of the Niger. When they impose sanction, when they impose sanction on Niger, they revived the River Niger trade. Mm -hmm. Some people lost their lives, unfortunately. So there, there are, there's also, there are also certain things we miss. 
in which there's a lot of traffic. So, so, so many Yoruba people live in Cote d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. And they, they are from one town dominantly called Ejibo. Mm -hmm. And many of women sure live in Northern Ghana. They speak multiple languages along the way, along the way. Or they create creolization along the way, along the way. So how to empower the unions of our people, not just the unions of the states like AU and ECOWAS, is something we also have to take more seriously because I've been to where our sister comes from and my favorite Amala place located on Buari Street. The, the, the people just interact. It's so intense uh, that, that, that if I go to, to just use Accra or Kumasi or Niame, I just feel at home. I don't see anyone calling me in Nigeria. I just, I just feel at home. So, and there's a sense in which this feeling at home connects with language and identity. The president of Niger, when they impose sanctions on him, his wife is from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So, so, so we have many things to develop. At what to call the organic levels, mm -hmm. things that are working, which sometimes we don't study them and sometimes we don't make them visible enough. Any other closing statement, our sister? Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Oga, uh, for giving us uh, this opportunity to have a dialogue and to also have a, a different part of Africa coming uh, together. You have uh, South Africa, Nigerian in, in base in South Africa. You have uh, uh, the Horn of Africa, West Africa, and East Africa in dialogue. And the gender question, by the way, it's March. And since it is March, <laughs> it's Women's History Month. What I would like to do in honor of what we are talking about is to show if I can share a little bit on my screen to show what is happening in a, in a- You have to first of all make you a co-host. Please make I, because if you are not a co-host, you can share. Please make Professor Alidu a co-host because she wants to share a document. Yeah, just to honor uh, to honor what we have discussed. Uh, this uh, you just mentioned you can eat a, eat a amala or um, eba or ewudu uh, in in Niger even you know uh, or if you are in Accra and this is a uh, African integration the regional integration and the regional integration uh, at the inf in what is so called informal economies actually gives us an idea of how- uh, Now you are a co-host, you can, you can share- the Thank you so much. Yeah. Colleagues, thank you for- I, I, I want to, is it possible? Okay. So you mentioned the Niger ri River, uh, and I'm interested in uh, the question of the ecology and what are the women, women uh, uh, filmmakers, documentary filmmakers are doing in promoting the use of African languages to understand ecological issues and uh, the integration of uh, of the uh, regions, um, so this is one one films. If you are whether in a you, you are an environmentalist, uh, you are uh, in a, in economies, you are looking at what is happening in the Sahel. I think this is one one of the uh, films that can be shown across discipline, right? It is a question about water. It is a question about climate change. It is a question about uh, migration. It is a question about economies, right? Um, and it is a question about endangerment of species when there is the dry out of the space. And uh, you, you have people speaking in uh, African languages to, to make uh, uh, this important uh, uh, issues dealing with the Anthropocene. Um, um, important for us. And this is the contribution of women fi filmmakers uh, to this uh, uh, to these questions of how to archive. Uh, uh, Stop reading research sorry. papers like this. Sorry, sorry. 
Um, I suppose. Uh, I'm going back and forth while reading. It's up more time than you could imagine. The... Instead, download Miner and ask directly on the page. Miner is uh, an AI co-pilot that answers your questions right where you are. I guess the AI in would be here yeah, before. Just open up Miner, type in your question. But it's um. <clears throat> Then Liner gives you the answer instantly. Sorry, just this way two minutes. you can streamline your research yeah. process, maintain your focus, and save hours. Download Liner today and start researching smarter. So, uh, this film is a, uh, oops, so, sorry, I want to, to stop it. Uh, Hello? You can send it to us. Yeah, I actually want to. Um, and if you give us permission, we can also share it. Yes. Oops, I just want to go back to. Yes, uh, Prof, I will. Oh, what is happening with this screen? Sorry. So here, here is a multilingual production, and uh, to show that uh, <coughs> people can speak uh, several languages, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, Niger River is a river that comes from the Atlantic, from the uh, the Gulf of Guinea, and go back into the Atlantic through the Sahara and all that, and it is it is bringing so many communities um, um, uh, together. And what does it mean when, for instance, we are dealing with uh, ecological change, uh, 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 desertification, and uh, mobility of people? Uh, this uh, uh, production uh, by Isa Tamaiga, who happens to be from uh, Mali and Senegal, to go, going to look at what is happening in Niger, shows the ways in which within a Pan-African uh, uh, thinking, we can contribute to problem solving by integrating our languages <clears throat> and speaking to our communities so that language policy vis-a-vis -vis economies for the people, the common people, not just for politicians, will be something that will advance so many people and will say something uh, to other worlds who are uh, uh, other worlds experiencing the same kind of challenges and we, Africa will contribute uh, to problem solving and uh, to global humanities uh, beyond, beyond our own uh, uh, peculiar situation. And Thank this you. is the contribution of women, women thinking the condition of women and their families and the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Mugane, as part of your closing statement, would you join me if I create a movement to insist that planes flying to Africa should use African languages. They do so in the Swahili route. Uh, if you fly South African airline, they, they speak in Swahili. But isn't it time? For those of you who eat African food in the plane, like jollof rice, you may not know that it's an initiative. It's a, it was a project in which we say, why can't you give us jollof rice and dodo? which they now do. And it, it, because we, for many things we believe in, it, they won't happen unless we convert them to specific political projects. So will you join me, sir? Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for organizing this uh, and uh, calling us to it. It's been lovely. <clears throat> And um, talking about issues that normally we find ourselves lonely and unable to find an audience to actually cobble up together to talk about it. 
and this is wonderful company. Um, so the the idea of planes, I mean, I was shocked the first time I heard it in Swahili long, long ago. They started doing it. Uh, <laughs> what I see, what I would say in in my closing uh, would be closing statement would be what uh, Professor Hussein Ali just showed and what I know others are doing. We need to actually immediately go to our communities and now start being fascinated by other Africans and translate ourselves to each other. I would love it very much if, for instance, I could see uh, some of those movies that are now coming up in those languages. And I do recall Somalia, for instance, um, they found the Europeans when they were coming to Africa, they found these goat herders and, and shepherds who are having a poetry thing that was actually much more advanced than Oxford, that they would sit un underneath out there and talk about, they're called the Sabib poetry, you know, and all the other stuff. And so there is a lot of exciting stuff that are actually local and, and doable, especially because things like movies and multimedia, this is where you learn. Learning languages is an epiphenomenon of social experience. It's not the target. You don't target learning language, you target knowing people and hearing these things. So I would, I, I really support the idea of we ourselves find out what is our canon. So we're talking about a, an archive, but what's our canon? What are the big works that are out there that we can actually bring them to us? If I hear about uh, the Yoruba, if I, I'm always told about it, that you actually even will not communicate. It won't answer you if you don't speak the Yoruba itself and so on. That for me is, is the exciting place because then people don't come to languages to be tortured by this idea of, embarrassments about sounds and all that, that is actually cheapening the whole thing. Then we become obstacles. The idea here would be that basically, you look at look at what we are representing here and how rich these places are. Girmai has got the horn over there. I am Somali by looks and everything. I'm already working with Somali language itself. And the idea is not just to then go greet people. It is actually to go there and find out what they're talking about and see a video or a film that is actually being produced. Then I ask, can I translate it in my own language? And when we translate it, then those, now we have a conversation that is actually among ourselves. To find love, we can't go abroad. We have to find love among ourselves. And I think that's that's a big thing that makes a humble job that they like teaching people languages and so on become wonderful. Because then now the the idea of our humanity is actually is actually shared. It, you know, what is happening in Chad and other places is also happening to us and so on. And like what's happened now with 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 these French speaking countries that have been overtaken and so on, and these guys are talking the way they are. There's a lot of opportunity there to actually go recognize each other, and and say we have the same kind of plight. I'll say one thing: when I went to Mali to get documents because we were collecting these core documents and other things, it was a mosque and it was next to the U.S. embassy, and they told me, "What brings you here? Why do you want our things? You're just going to take them back to America and all the other stuff." And I told them, as far as I remember, my history was from the Niger Delta. So I can come back home and actually take what they want. And if you have anything that you want from me, go to East Africa and take what you want. We, we are the same people. And and there they actually then would say, wasa, wasa, whatever it is, they made noises. So they didn't look very scary. But I told them if I scare them, then they should give me a, they should give me a signal to actually keep it down. But the idea is that there is a lot. We Africans need to see each other. We need to hear each other, and actually, it would actually be a wonderful thing. And the language <laughs> is going to do it. Sorry for making it longer than. No, no, it's not long, and no, I've right, enjoyed right. it. Thank you all, and um, hopefully, we'll would set up some initiative to continue with this conversation and to turn to some of them into practical projects. It should be possible to insist, for instance, that if you are flying to Senegal, the hostess or the host should be able to communicate in one love. <laughs> and do things like that. Uh, for empowering our languages, either as epistemologies, as theories and practical projects, we cannot thank you all enough. So I will reflect on this conversation as I always do in three or four pieces, bringing all what you've said together in, to the public in, in, in newspapers and on the internet. The media will carry it. And on March 17, please join us. It's an all-women affair, uh, talking about women issues on March 17. And um, Professor Negash, when you want to teach the 
epistemologists and African languages kindly give me a lecture, which I can deliver for Zoom on Zoom, talking about Yoruba epistemologies. Uh, and I have a forthcoming book with Ohio University Press on Yoruba metaphysics with density in languages and the fact that um, Professor Mungani spoke about. So if you want to enjoy music, you can stay a little bit. In the next 10 minutes, you will collect by email the entire transcript of this conversation. Thank you very much. Until we meet again, bye-bye now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Kodi.